So this is James Crumbly, Dave Bourne. James Crumbly, case number 22279989 FH. Thank you. Good morning, Mark Eason, on behalf of the people. Attorney McDonald, on behalf of the people. Good morning, Honor Marie Al Layman, on behalf of James Crumbly, who's standing to my left. I just want to make sure you can hear. Can you hear us, Mr. Crumbly? No. Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay, ready for the quiz? What quiz next, guys? Detective Adam Sawyer. All right, ready for the hearing? Yes, right. Adam Swayak, A D A M S T O Y E K. Thank you. Because so while we get started, we're going to see if we can have uh, a connection here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, sir, if you didn't already say you tell your full name. Adam Soraya, A-D-A-M-S-T-O-Y-E-K. Thank you, sir. How are you employed? I'm a detective of the Open County Sheriff's Office. I'm assigned to City of Pineapple. Okay. How long have you been a police officer? 12 years, right around 12 years. And how long have you been a detective? Right around four years. Okay. You say you're assigned to Pontiac? Yeah, the City of Pontiac substation. Okay. Now, I want to direct your attention to November the 30th, 2021. Do you remember that day? I do. Hey, were you working? I was. We heard testimony yesterday regarding a search warrant at 12 East in, the, in Oxford, the Crumbly family home. Did you participate in that search warrant? I did. Now, if you could tell us, please, what happens um, when a house is secured for a search warrant? Yeah, so securing the house prior to uh, getting the search warrant, they're going to go initially and just kind of do an initial sweep of the house to make sure no one's inside the house, um, no one's injured inside the house. And then after that, you're just going to secure the house until you get the authorization from the judge, um, just for like preservation of evidence and make sure that if there is evidence inside the house, that it's not tampered with. Okay, and did you do that in this case? I did. And who else was with you? Uh, Detective McPherson, Detective Steele. Uh, Detective Peschke, Deputy Zajac, uh, Deputy Mozak, and uh, Fred Brandon was there too. From the ETF? Correct. Okay. 
And when you were sent to that location, did you know what would be found there? No. Okay. And when were you assigned with this task? Um, after we initially searched the school, um, my supervisor at the time, Sergeant Hicks, he uh, gathered a few of us up and said, to go to 112 East Street and secure the residence. Okay. So you responded to the school first, and then you were tasked with securing the, the residence at 112 East Oxford? Correct. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to show you what's been admitted as people's 270. Sir, is this a photograph? This photograph really actually depicts the address at 112 East? It does. Okay, describe the layout for us of the home. Yes, yeah, so it's uh, when you walk in here, that's the front of the road that's at faces East Street. Um, walk in um, to your immediate right, there's a living room area, the couch, there's a TV. Um, walk into the left, it was like the uh, dining room, there was a table, chairs. Uh, through that, there was a kitchen. Um, off the kitchen, there was two bedrooms, one on the right, one on the left, a bathroom. Yeah, I'm going to show you what's yeah. been as well as 205. Is this a sketch of the home? Correct. Okay. And so we have a front entrance at the top of the diagram here? Correct. Okay. Can you just walk us through here? Yeah, so uh, where the sheriff's symbol sign is there at the front of the residence, um, you walk in. So be on the left of this picture here is the living room. Um, there's some couches, there's a TV stand, a uh, table. To the right there of that was the dining room. There's a, like a kitchen table, um, two chairs. I think there's some workout equipment in there. Um, past that, there's a little opening right there. It's like the kitchen, uh, refrigerator island, some cabinets. Um, so right there to the left um, would be the entrance. There's a little hallway to two bedrooms or one bedroom. That's the north bedroom. There's a bathroom between that. And then across the hallway, there was like the middle bedroom uh, with the bedrooms. And then uh, you come out of there, there was a little hallway. Uh, there was an opening to like a landing that led to the basement, the foyer, um, and it was what was the master bedroom was immediately past that. Okay. Now, prior to participating in the search of this home, did you learn which bedrooms were associated with the shooter? I did. Which one? So, in this picture here, you see North bedroom was one of the shooter's bedrooms, and then directly across the hallway, which is labeled middle bedroom, there was also the shooter's bedroom. Okay, so his rooms were what we have labeled here is North bedroom and then middle bedroom. Both are adjacent to the bathroom, and middle bedroom is adjacent to the master bedroom. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Now tell us, <clears throat> when you first entered the home to secure it for a search warrant, did you see anything of note? Yeah, so obviously when you're, you're kind of just doing the search, you're obviously still, you're, if you see things, you take a mental note of what you see. Um, and when I walked into what I was described as a master bedroom, there was an open uh, six hour gun box on the bed and next to that was an empty box of uh, nine millimeter ammunition okay. on the bed as well. Did you touch that? I did not, no. Okay, so when you see something like that, what do you do? Yeah, you just kind of take a mental note of it. Um, and obviously once you get the authorization from the judge and the search warrant, you're gonna go. Um, search the house, and my partner and I were tasked with searching that bedroom, so okay. we were aware before we came in. So after the home was secured, and you confirmed that, well, first of all, when it was secured, did you encounter either James or Jennifer Crumley? I did. I had a uh, brief encounter with James Crumley. Okay, is he in court today? He is. Can you please point to him to describe something he's wearing? Uh, he's wearing the suit with the blue shirt and the blue tie. We are with record reflect and vacation defendant. The record is still okay. Tell us where you encountered James Crumley when you arrived on scene. Uh, when I initially got there, he was secured in, I don't remember who, Deputy Mozak or Deputy Zajac's uh, patrol vehicle. Okay. Now, if an admitted video of, an, you know, of a patrol video indicated 2.46 p.m. arrival on November the 30th, 2021, did that seem right to you? Yes. Okay. Did you speak with Mr. Crumley? I did. Okay. Um, did you speak with him on scene there or when he was transported to the substation? So I had a brief conversation with him prior or at the substation, really nothing to know, when he was taken back to the uh, residence, and that's where I had more of a, not in depth, but more of a conversation with him outside of the residence. Okay. So I'm going to show you and play that's been admitted as people's 300. This is the in car video that you referenced. This one is the bottom one. Thank you. I have a scene right now. Why is she in here? I don't know. Can you make the hand up for please? Okay. Well, in person, Here, I'm 
shut it down, and then, and then I have a cop coming and cut it. Timestamp is 2:50 p.m. November 30th. Does that appear right to you? It does. Okay. <clears throat> now you said James was transported to the south station and taken back. Yeah, there's I mean there's a lot going on. So initially we were kind of instructed to take James to the substation and interview him. Um, after a conversation with I believe Sergeant Brian, it was determined that he had already spoken with uh, detectives prior to us getting there, so he was taken back to the house um, while we were waiting for the search warrant to be uh, completed. Okay, so we heard testimonies in this trial that Sergeant Brian began that interview at 1:58 p.m. And this occurred after that, is that right? Yeah, it was after the initial interview. Did you have some conversation with James about obtaining a search warrant for the home? Yeah, I had a brief conversation. With him. Okay. Did you let him know you were looking for firearms? I did. Yes. And would that conversation have been recorded on the in-car video system as well? Yes. Okay. I'm going to show you what's been admitted and played for you. Is it 204? This is a portion of the in-car video from 3.42 p.m. on November 30th. Hey, man. Hey, so just had a name or question. I don't know if you want to talk to you. Can you just call it? James. Yep. You want my middle name too? No, what's your last name? Crumbly, C R U M B L E Y. What's your phone number? 6483. Okay. So, what's going on is we're waiting for uh, the search warrant, okay? So, what we're going to do is we're going to, you guys, obviously, while we're waiting to go into the house, we can't have you guys go back in right now, just while we get the search warrant. So, you're more than welcome to either sit in here. You're more than welcome to get in your car and hang out until this is done. You're more than welcome to get a cup of coffee if you want or something, but it's probably going to be a little while. Um, so it's kind of up to you. But while we're waiting for that, we just ask how to please don't go inside the house while we wait for everything to be done, okay? Um, in the meantime, can you tell me where those guns are so you don't have to rip your house apart? Is that cool? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We're in a, they're in a gun, a gun case. We're, we're, we're at the house. Okay. And if you go to the very back of the, the, the very back of the house. We're like the Oscar the city? Yes. Okay. Yes. And he's nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's nice. So then you guys can just be cognizant of the doors. We have cats. Okay. Okay. Um, but if you go into that back bedroom, okay. there's a dresser on the left with the TV sitting on. Yep. Yep. The very right cabinet door. Okay. Inside of there, there's a black gun case that's okay. locked. Okay. And then there's some 20 there's just there's only a 20 there's a 22 um derringer okay. and a 22 um Kel tech it's locked pistol the case is locked do we have what you get into that 
you mind if you get to that? I mean, if you absolutely have to. Is it kind of like what kind of combination on it? Combination. Okay. Do you mind if we? Because we're gonna have to get the gun obviously for now. Yeah. Yeah. Do you mind? Otherwise, I don't want to answer. You know what I mean? No, I'm completely open, and I want you guys to do what you have to do. Zero. 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 Three euros. Four. And that's that's the only. Oh, okay. And then in. The bedroom to the left of the um, the left of the bathroom. Okay. There is a BB gun. Okay. It's unloaded, okay. but it looks like a freaking assault rifle. Okay. Cool. It's a, it's one of those air AR-15. Well, it's not AR-15. It's something different, but it's a it's one of those air you know air cartridge yeah, BB oh, gun. Okay. Um, okay. But that's just I mean that's just sitting out. So don't freak out when you guys see that. It's not a. I appreciate that. Yeah. Are you going to want to hang tight or you, what are you guys going to want to do? Well, I mean, where's my wife? I want to, you know. What, what does she want to do? Okay. Do you want to go with your wife then? Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, so my wife. Do you know, sir, you talked to Sergeant Ryan earlier? Yes. Okay. He's going to call you when you guys are able to come back, okay? Okay. Fair enough. Um, I'll leave my phone back. Um, so backing up a little bit, can you tell us why Jennifer probably wouldn't bust? Yeah, there, there was multiple, there were a few detectives, there were deputies on scene. Um, I didn't take part in placing their handcuffs. Um, that was enough to the deputy that put her handcuffs. The deputies that arrived were coming right from the school, is that right? Correct. Okay. Yes. Um, just now in this, this interview with James Crumbly in the back of the car, he told you the combination code was zero, 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 zero. Four zeros, is that right? Correct. Did you subsequently recover that save? I did. Was it four zeros or three zeros? It was three zeros. Okay. Did you come to learn what the default code is for that save? It's zero, zero, zero. Now, <clears throat> what did you find inside that save? Yes, yeah, so inside the safe, there was a 22 Caltech handgun and a 22 Derringer, which is like a single shot handgun was inside the safe and it was opened up. Okay. Once the search warrant was officially authorized by the judge, did you participate in the search of the home? I did. Yeah. And there are actually two occasions on which detectives entered the home with authorization from the search warrant. Is that correct? Correct. So once it was November 30th, the evening shooting, and their time was September, I'm sorry, December the 13th? Correct. Okay, both 2020. Correct. correct. Okay. All right, I'm going to take you through some photographs of the home. Um, first of all, prior to the search warrant being executed at somebody's residence, are photographs taken? They are. Are they taken before or after the home is searched? Uh, before. Okay. So any photograph received from November the 30th, 2021 was taken before the room was searched by an inspector. That's correct. This is exhibit 249. Tell us what we're looking at here. Yeah, so the initial picture, that's the front door of the residence, right? You walk into your immediate right, there's couches and a TV uh, or the living room area. So I'll try to take us through the home as you would walk through it. So we have the door in, in the frame here. Correct. That's okay. the front door that faces East Street. That's the front door in the living room. Okay. This is 250. What is it? It's just a uh, wider angle. It's the couch that we saw in the initial picture and the other couch that, that would be facing the front door. Okay. So if you step into the front door and you turn to your right, this is what you'd be looking at? Correct. All right. This is exhibit 251. What is this? Yeah, same thing, right? We walk in the front door, just a VT immediate right, kind of straight ahead, there's just a couches and then a chair, table. Okay, here's 252. Again, we see the front door. Yep, so that would be, now you'd actually be facing the front door. That was just the TV stand, which had the TV on it towards the front door. Okay, and you told us that there was the living room, and then in the same area, you, you described the dining room? Correct. Okay. This is exhibit 272. What do we see here? Yep, so that was the dining room. It was uh, some Christmas decorations, uh, dining room table. And this photograph was taken on December the 13th, 2021. Yes, this was not the night of. So this is if you walk in the front door and you turn to your left. Is that right? Correct. Yep. You walk in your immediate left would be this. And here's 273. What do we see here? Yep. So that'd be we walk into the right was the living room, to the left was the dining room, and directly ahead of the dining room was the doorway that leads to the kitchen, which you can kind of see in the background there is the kitchen. Okay. Here's 274. Yep. So this would just be a, a picture of the kitchen, the island refrigerator. And as you can see further down in the picture is the door to the master bedroom. Okay, so this would be if you step towards that hallway, towards the kitchen? Correct. Yeah, you're, at, you're exiting the living room, there's that little doorway, and that's going to take you right into the kitchen area. Okay, we'll talk more about the kitchen in a few minutes. First, I want to take you through uh, one of the shooter's bedrooms, identified as the middle bedroom. Okay, this is exhibit 206. What do we see here? Yep, so that would be, there's a hallway, there's a bedroom to the left, bathroom, bedroom to the right. This is the bedroom to the left, which is the middle bedroom. Um, that was right when you walk in the bedroom, there was a, a bed with a... Uh, 
various belongings on it, and then on the, on the wall you can see some uh, shooting targets or targets. Okay, and as police officer, you've been to a shooting range before, is that right? Correct. Okay, this is the type of targets consistent with what you obtained in a shooting range? Correct. Okay. And this photograph is taken November the 30th, 2021? Yes. This is Exhibit 207, are we in the same room? Same room, just uh, off the bed there, there was that uh, desk with a TV, um, just things all over the floor. Um, that, that was a natural state of bedroom we got in the house. When you say natural state, that, that's before the impact of search. Yeah, correct. And this plywood right here, can you tell us about this, please? Yeah, so that um, that part of the bedroom actually leads, that would have been a window that would have gone to the master bedroom. Um, I believe the master bedroom is probably an add-on. Um, so that would be a window that would lead you to the master bedroom. Okay, so so we're making sure we're oriented. This middle bedroom is adjacent to both the master bedroom on one side and then the bathroom on the other. Correct. Okay. This is exhibit 208. Is the same room from a different vantage point? Same room, yeah. The, uh, just another little uh, dresser there, the closet on the left. Okay. Exhibit 209. Same thing, just the uh, various things on the floor, clothing, um, the chairs, same bedroom. And exhibit 210? Yep, same bedroom, just kind of an hour shot that shows the, uh, the whole bedroom there. Sir, as a, as a detective, tell us why it's important for someone to capture a the natural state of something from different angles. Yeah, so I mean, when you conduct a search warrant, obviously you, you want to be cognizant of the fact that someone's house, you don't want to tear the house up, but I mean, you're going to go through the house and things are going to get moved around, um, do the best to clean up afterwards. But uh, when you want to, a picture of this can show you what the house looked like right when you walked in, nothing was changed. And, what the livable conditions were when we got there. Okay. And is that also why you would take multiple pictures of one bedroom just from different angles? Correct. Yeah, just so you can get a full shot of what the uh, was actually going on inside the bedroom. This is exhibit 211. Is this also the middle bedroom? That is it. It's the closet in the middle bedroom. Exhibit 212, same closet? Same closet. You can see there in the bottom on the chair was the uh, butt of the, uh, which Mr. Crumley described as like the um, rifle style DV gun. Okay. We'll get to that in a second. This is exhibit 213. What do we see here? Yeah, those are the, uh, the targets I described earlier. They're visibly confused. Um, they visibly they made bullet holes in the multiple bullet holes in both of them. That was on the wall right next to the bed, which you would better. This is exhibit 214. Yep, same thing, just a different angle. Um, that's the bed to your far left, and then the uh, the used shooting target on the top right corner. If there were any other posters or pictures on the wall, that would have been depicted in the photographs of these seconds. Is that right? Correct. This is exhibit 215. There's a picture of the bed. Uh, there's clothing, clothing, some school books, uh, the knife on the bed there. Just there's tons of different stuff on the bed. And so where where the 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 targets that were on the wall, that'd be just where this um, photograph cuts off at the top. Yeah, right? just above the bottom, okay. the top part of the target would be or of this picture is where the targets would be. Okay. Here's 216. What are we looking at here? Yeah, so that's a like a nightstand just off the bed. Um, various things on the nightstand. And 242. This is a closer version. Close. Excuse me. A closer photograph of the items on the next hand. Yeah, correct. Look, it was um, various spent shell casings. Um, looks like various like caliber spent shell casings inside the uh, plastic container, which is on a nightstand, which is directly next to the uh, shooter's bed. And this is exhibit 243. You mentioned the butt of the, the rifle that gun in an earlier photograph. Is this what you're referring to? Correct. When I was speaking with James earlier, the video you played earlier, you kind of described that was the one he told me not to be uh, freaked out about. Um, it was the BB gun rifle that was on the uh, the shooter's better than his computer chair, and that's how it was when it was found. This is exhibit 244, what's that? So that would be part of the dresser there that the TV's on. Um, he had various, there was a notebook there, uh, pencil, stuff like that, his wallet. Um, that was on the TV stand. In, in the middle bedroom stuff? Correct, so the middle bedroom. Okay. And 245, same drawer, different angle? Yeah, correct. Looks like it's a lighter, um, you know, the fireworks of some kind. Um, just another, another notebook, and that was also in the uh, middle bedroom on the dresser there. Okay. And exhibit 246, we're still in the middle bedroom? Yep, still in the middle bedroom, so that's going to be right at the front of the bed. Um, it's a bottle, it looks like it's an empty bottle of Canada House, which is bourbon whiskey. The end of the bed. Now I'm going to move on to the north bedroom. This was identified as the shooter's other bedroom? Correct. Okay, so this would be the bedroom on the other side of the bathroom? Yep, so when you came into the, out of the kitchen, you made that right, there's a small hallway straight ahead of the bathroom to the right was gonna be the bedroom we're gonna see now, which is the north bedroom, and to the left is that middle bedroom which you guys just saw in the pictures right. Okay, so here's exhibit 217. What are we looking at here? Yep, so just kind of a, uh, a shot of the overall bedroom on the right, um, which is also the shooter's bedroom, second bedroom. 218, same north bedroom, but from a different angle? Correct, it would be right when you walk into your immediate left, there's a TV stand, a TV, um, some clothing on the floor, and on your right there you can see the bed, which had uh, various things spread all over it. Okay, again, this is the natural state of how you found it? Correct. 219, what are we looking at here? Yep, so that would be you walk in, you make a left, at this point they're kind of rounding the back. I'm sorry, 282, I missed one. It would just be a picture of the uh, of the bed, and then on the, in the far left corner there is a litter box, cat litter box on the ground there. So far left corner? Yeah, so you get right there. Yeah. Oh, I see, okay. Uh, just various clothing and other items on the bed. 
Uh, 219, are we still in the north bedroom? Correct, is the closet, uh, closing apartment. All right, 220, what is this? It's just a bed, uh, again, various things on the bed. Um, is it 247? Yeah, so that was a notebook that was recovered in the bedroom. Um, obviously, there's some pictures of a rifle on it. Um, looks like another handgun in the bottom left there. Okay, that's uh, 247. That was found on the bed in the north bedroom? Yeah, correct. Uh, here's 221. Are we still in the north bedroom? Yeah, so that's just now you're like looking out towards the bedroom. That's the that doorway to the far left is the door that means out of the bedroom. That open door was the open door to the bedroom that we saw the initial pictures in. Just straight directly across the hall. They were both the shooter's bedrooms. Okay, did you observe anything on the shelf? <laughs> yeah, there were some uh, knives, various knives on the shelves. Okay, and that's depicted in exhibit 248? Correct. And then finally, exhibit 222. This is standing in the north bedroom looking down at the, the TV with it. Yeah, there's the, the TV stand. It's got a little fireplace there and various items on the TV stand. Okay, so we mentioned the bathroom that was adjacent to these two bedrooms. This is exhibit 223. Does this accurately depict what you observed that day? Yep, it does. Now, did you also participate in the search of the master bedroom? I did. Okay, you mentioned what you observed during that um, process when you secured the home, mm -hmm. but you participated in the search as well? Correct. This is exhibit 224. What do we see here? Yes, yeah, so you walk into the master bedroom, which you'll see other pictures here, but to your immediate right, the master bedroom was the bed. Um, and right when you walked in, this was the first thing you could see was the open gun box. Um, and that box next to it is an empty box of uh, nine millimeter ammunition. And this is exactly how we, we saw it when we did the initial search of the house. And then when we came back in, once the search warrant was granted, this is, this is how it was when we came in. Okay. And this box right here is the uh, empty box of ammunition, the red box? Correct, nine millimeter ammunition. <laughs> this is exhibit 225. This is the same master bedroom. Yeah, just kind of a different view, but that's, uh, that'd be make a right in the bedroom, the bed was against the wall, and that was one of the sides of the bed. Exhibit 226? Yeah, same thing, just the other side of the bed. So that, that far window right there on the left would be the window that would face the backyard of the residence. Okay. Exhibit 227? Yeah, far left side of the bed there. Um, that's the other window that faces the backyard, and it's just poking on the ground. Okay, 228, this is still in the master bedroom? Yep, so that's the door there to the master bedroom. Um, when you walk in immediately, on this the, is the door here? Correct. Okay. And on the wall there was an uh, armbar. Um, on the far, or on the immediate right, was that armbar. Okay. And this is exhibit 229? Yep, there's a different shot. That's the door. Immediate right's that armbar. Um, to your left, and that picture's the bed. Okay, just so we're all these pictures of the man's bed were taken November the 30th before the room was searched. Correct. Now, uh, was the TV stand searched as well? It was. Okay. And that's where James told you to look for the 22 caliber firearms? Correct. Uh, exhibit 230, this is the TV stand I'm referring to? Yep, so that was what James had described when I spoke with him. Um, that's the TV stand right when you walk into the bedroom uh, to your immediate left was that TV stand, multiple drawers and a TV on it. Uh, but then the door you're seeing, there was like a sliding glass door that would lead you to the outside backyard of the residence. So this is exhibit 231, this is just straight on view? Correct. Exhibit 233, this is angled to the left? Correct. All right, 234, what are we looking at here? Yep, so um, that TV stand we just saw, the furthest right door that was opened up, and that was where the, uh, the gun boxes or the gun safe was located right there on the top shelf, as it is in the picture there. Okay. And did you use the code 000 to open it? I did. Did we open with that? It did. Was ammunition found on that shelf as well? Yep, so when, you, when the uh, gun box was removed from there, there was uh, two magazines, the holster, it's kind of hard to see, but you can see there, uh, there's a box of uh, ammunition there in the back. Okay. You say holster. What we're looking at, the object on the right, that's the holster? Yeah, it's like a cloth holster, okay. black cloth holster. This is exhibit 235. 236, were those items from that right um, drawer taken out and put on top of the TV stand? Yep, so at this point, they were removed from the picture you just saw. They were put on top of the TV stand. On the left there, you can see the two magazines, gun magazines up, and then there's the bag, bag with the uh, ammunition in it. And then I think at the right there's the box for the ammunition. Okay. And that's 22 caliber ammunition? Correct. Okay. Did you participate in the search of the kitchen as well? I did. Okay. First of all, here's 237. This is what, so let me ask you, what did you, what is this picture? Yep. So the um, black firearm there is a 22 uh, Caltech handgun that was recovered when I opened the safe. Uh, the, the silver uh, gun there is a 22 Derringer. It's a single shot gun that was also found in the, uh, in the safe once I opened it up, and then there was another uh, magazine there at the far left, which is kind of hard to see, and then there's some uh, ear protection, the uh, orange ear protection is also located in the safe when it was opened. So this is 238, what is this? That's the uh, 22 Derringer that was recovered in the safe. And 240. Yep, that's a 22 uh, contact handgun that was recovered in the safe. 
Okay, so this is 276. Can you tell us what we're looking at here? Yeah, so that would be the kitchen, uh, the picture you saw earlier. Uh, that, that would have been on the right-hand side, and we saw the pictures of the kitchen. It's the refrigerator. Okay, so I'm going to try to take us around the kitchen. Is it, well, first of all, is there an island in the kitchen? Yeah, so um, when you're looking outside the kitchen, there was an island in the middle. Uh, there was across from that, there was like a sink, some shelving units, and then across, all across from the island is this, which is the fridge, more shelving units, uh, all located in the kitchen. Okay. This is 278, so this would be on the other side of the kitchen? Yep, correct. So that would just be, when I describe the other side of the island, you have the sink there on the left, uh, the stove, um, and just various cabinets and other things in the kitchen there. Did you have a search in this island here? I did. Okay. This is 277, that's the island I'm referring to? Correct. All right. Exhibit 253. Tell us what we're looking at here and where it was found. Yep, so on the far right corner there, you can see the black, uh, which is later discovered to be a black gun box there in the far right corner. Let me back up for one second. So we're talking about, I'm sorry, this cover here, the right cover? Oh, that I believe it was, yes, the right okay. cover, correct. That's 277, here's 253? Correct. Yep, so there in the far right corner, you can kind of see that black uh, gun box. Was located there in the island on the right side of the island. Okay, and was that was that removed? It was. Okay. This is it a two fifty five? What is this? Yeah, so that's just the uh, the gun box was taken out of there. And, uh, that's just a picture of the gun box. It was the gun box for that Caltech, that black uh, firearm that was found in the bedroom. This is the gun box for that twenty two handgun. Okay. And this is two fifty six. What are we looking at here? Yeah, so the gun box was open. Uh, it was obviously empty. Besides that, uh, cable lock was located inside of the gun box. Uh, if you look closely, you can see the keys to the gun or to the cable lock there in the bottom part of the. Baggy there. Um, that's how that was located when it was opened up. Did you or any other detective find any other locking mechanism for a fire anywhere in the home? No. Do you want to say this? Are the gun box next to the wonder what kind of gun box was there? That was for the uh, the 22 Caltech with the black handgun that was found in the safe in the bedroom. All right. Okay. Cool. And that's an exhibit 253, which is also depicted in exhibit 255. And that's where the cable lock was contained, depicting exhibit 256. Is that right? Correct. Okay. All right. Um, all right. What are we looking at here at 257? That's just a gaming system. I believe there's a PlayStation uh, gaming system that was located in the residence. Okay. 258. Yeah, those are um, games for that uh, gaming system Battlefield, uh, Assassin's Creed, Battlefront. Um, just various games that were located inside of the residence for that gaming system. All right. Here's 259. Yep. Yeah, looks like those are more games Grand Theft Auto. Uh, I'm not familiar with the other ones, Battlefield, and then a few sort of like that. Okay, 260. The Call of Duty, um, Attack of on Titan, some other games that we use in that gaming system. All right, because anything starts outside the home? Yeah, so outside the house, there was a vehicle, a great Kia, that was located in the driveway. Uh, it's Mr. Crumley's vehicle. Uh, this is a picture of the, when the trunk was opened up, what was in the back of the vehicle. Were there any, uh, was there a garage or shed associated with the home? Yeah, no garage. So um, the first picture we saw was the outside of the house. There was a, or a driveway to the left of that that led to the backyard. And in the backyard, there's a shed in the backyard, but there's no enclosed garage or anything like that. Okay, was the shed searched as well? The shed was searched, correct. All right, here's exhibit 298. Before we get to the shed, what are we looking at here? Yeah, it's just like an overhang, like almost like a foyer outdoor area that was covered. Um, there's a grill out there, like a seating area, which is on the back of the residence prior to getting to the shed. Okay. Here's exhibit 299, shed referred to? Correct. Is it 264? Are we seeing here? Yeah, so you walk into the shed immediate, immediately through the door to the right. There was a couple of BB guns right leaning against the wall there. As you can see the one, the brown one to the far left of the picture, and then the black one, which is resting against kind of the door frame there. Okay. Is it 265? Yeah, just a different angle. Uh, you can see the, the black BB gun in the right corner, and the brown ones right there visible leaning against the wall. Is it 266? This, this is like on the workbench in the uh, shed there. Um, there was some BB guns recovered. That's like a Z style uh, BB gun that was sitting on the bench when we were inside of the shed. Exhibit 267. Another BB gun, it's uh, like a 357 BB gun that was uh, seated on. Same thing, right by the Uzi there, you walk in, there was a big, a big bench, and that was on the bench when you walked into the shed. Okay, here's exhibit 268. Yeah, so you can kind of see the uh, work area there in the back where the BB guns are recovered. It's just kind of an outer shop, so the chairs and the, and the floor of the shed. Uh, 269, what are we looking at here? Yeah, so that was outside of the shed with various uh, CO2 containers which are used to shoot BB guns, pellet guns on the ground there. Okay. Now, back in the home, exhibit 289, where was this taken? Yeah, so when you, as I described, when you walk in the hallway to the floor of the master bedroom, there was like a landing that led you to the basement into the outside of the house. So this was just an hour picture of that landing area. Uh, to the left of that photo was taken the basement and to the right to take you to the, to the backyard. Okay. And exhibit 295? Yeah, same thing. Just kind of a landing, just an outer picture of that. Once you go there to the right, is that door that leads to the backyard. And if you went down to the left, that would take you down to the basement area for the house. 
any areas of the home that were not photographed during the execution search warrant? No, I was photographed. Okay. Now, we heard the video where you told James that he and his wife could leave. That was time stamped at 3.42 p.m. At some point, did they return? Yep, so um, after we were done with the search warrant, they returned to the residence, and uh, yeah, they spoke with the tenant Mars band. Okay. That. Were there phone seats at that point? They were. Okay, and at some point, were they turned over to Oakland County Computer Crime? Yeah, they were driven back to the high school by myself and Detective Pearson, and they were given to uh, Detective Lebrowski. Nothing further, thank you. Yes, Your Honor. One moment. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to take you back just to the beginning of your direct. In exhibit, oh, this is a lot of In exhibit um, 205. There we go. Exhibit 205 is the map that was drawn. Excuse me. The map that was drawn of the Crumbly residence. Correct. And this is of the interior of the residence. You agree? Correct. Now, you also looked at the exterior of the residence because you went in the shed in the backyard, correct? Correct. And if you recall, it's a fairly deep lot. Yeah, it's got a large backyard. Okay. So what you see from the street, the house is closer to the street than closer to the back of the lot. Would that be fair? That's fair. Okay. So it's not like a, a small backyard. It's it's fairly deep, which means that there's a, a lot of space between the back of the backyard and the front of the house. Is that fair? Yeah, so there was a fairly large fenced-in backyard. Um, I don't know exactly how big, but yeah, I mean, it was it was large. There was, there was a lot of space. Thank you. <clears throat> when you first went into the home, you you did the initial sweep to make sure that there were no other people in the house, correct? Correct. And, and that's common. That's common practice for executing a search warrant securing the premises. Correct. And in the home, you noticed that there was an open six hour box with an empty box of nine millimeter ammunition in the master bedroom on the bed. Yeah, correct. That was one of the first things I saw when I walked in the bedroom. And the master bedroom you identified as James Crumley's bedroom. Correct. And we'll look at, if you need to, we can look at the photo. But do you recall that that, that box of ammunition was Patriot Defense nine millimeter ammunition? That sounds correct. Okay. We looked at exhibit 300, which was the first video from approximately 2.50 p.m. in the back of the patrol car. Do you recall reviewing that video? I do. You would agree that as James's wife is being placed in the patrol car with handcuffs, James is obviously distraught. He's asking questions like, why are you in handcuffs? Why is she in handcuffs? Correct? I'm going to object to the form of the question of obviously distraught. I don't think he's able to see that sort of testimony. Uh, um, were you able to observe his demeanor? Yeah, I mean, he was obviously wondering what was going on, asking questions. Uh, yeah. He was upset. And I don't really know him. I mean, he was asking a lot of questions. Um, yeah. Trying to figure out what was going on. Correct. You watched the video more. And you reviewed that prior that video prior to coming in today, correct? The in car video? Yes, yeah, exhibit three hundred. I've seen the video before. Okay. And the reason I'm asking that is because you wouldn't have seen this exchange unless you reviewed the video, which is why I'm asking. But there was a point in the video where James leans over to his wife and tells her he loves her. Do you remember seeing that? Correct. And if you recall, he comments, just in case anything happens, I love you, and he gives her a kiss. Correct. So you would agree that James had some concern that something bad might happen. I believe at some point the state's somewhere along the lines of that, so yeah, correct. You said after that Exhibit 300 video, James was transported to the substation to be interviewed by law enforcement, correct? Yeah, like I said, there was a lot going on. Initially, we were, we were instructed to talk to him, and after speaking with Sergeant Bryant, it was determined that he had already spoken with him, so he was brought back at that point. Right, so either on the way or once you got to the substation, you learned that, that James had already spoken to Sergeant Bryant prior to you all arriving at his residence, and so you took him back to the residence. Correct. Exhibit 204 is at approximately 3.42 p.m. Oh, let me go back to Exhibit 300. There was a point in that video where James makes a comment to his wife about um, not talking about a lawyer. Do you remember seeing that? Correct. Okay. Now, you know that if somebody is being suspected of a crime, you've been a detective for a while. Is that fair? Sure. Okay. You know that if somebody's being suspected of a crime or suspected of doing something wrong, they have the right to counsel. Correct. Asking for a lawyer or wanting a lawyer doesn't mean anything other than I want a lawyer with me. Is that fair? Sure. Okay. Exhibit 204 is after that initial video with James and his wife in the back of the patrol car. Do you agree with that? Um, is that the uh, video where I was speaking with him? Yeah, at 3.42 p.m. Correct. At that point, you're waiting for the search warrant to be signed by the court. I am. And you talk to James, and you have a, a couple of, of exchanges, and then you ask him if he's willing to tell you where the firearms are, correct? Yeah, I kind of explained in the, he could sit in the car, he could go sit in his car, um, didn't have to say where he was when he was talking to me. And then after that, yeah, we had the exchange about where the weapons were in the house. And he used the word absolutely, mm -hmm. if he would be willing to tell you where those firearms were, correct? Yeah, he was cooperating. I was speaking with him. He told you that they were in a gun case? Correct. That was locked? Correct. That it was in the back of the house, the room in the back of the house? Correct. In the TV stand? Correct. He told you that it was the right cabinet door? 
Correct. That the gun safe contained a 22 Danger and a 22 Tal Pack. Correct. And then he gave you the combination, but we would agree that he actually added a digit to the combination. Yeah, he told me there was four zeros, and it actually there was three zeros to get inside the safe. And it's obvious by looking at the gun case, or I'm sorry, the gun safe, that there's only three numbers on it, right? Yeah, the dial has three numbers on it. So you couldn't have added a fourth number. Correct. You would agree that there was a lot going on at that moment? There was a lot going on at that moment. For both you and also Mr. Crumbly? Correct. Through your involvement in this case, you're not aware um, whether you're not aware that anyone else in the house had knowledge of that combination. Is that fair? You don't know if anyone else had it. Yeah, I don't know. And James also made comments to you about being completely open and wants you to do whatever you have to do. Is that correct? Correct. And you said he was cooperative with you. When I spoke with him, he was, yes. In fact, he even commented and told you about that. Um, that rifle-looking BB gun that was in his son's room and, and wanted to assure you that it, it wasn't what it looked like. Yeah, he told me before going in the house that there was going to be that um, rifle that was a BB gun sitting in the shooter's bedroom, correct? There was some exchange, and it sounded like, like James was going to leave the premises with his wife, but said that he needed his phone back. At that point, you all had taken his phone, if you recall. Yeah, so I, did, I at that point did not have his phones, and I honestly don't know who had the phones at that point, so I don't recall. You knew at that point that he didn't have his phone, based on his statements. Yeah, I knew at that point his phone was not on his person. And we'll get back to that in a minute, because you did talk about that a little bit more. In Exhibit 215, which is a photo of, I believe the, I think we call it the north bedroom. I'm sorry, the middle bedroom. There, You commented that there's a knife on the bed. It was a butter knife, correct? Yeah, correct. Exhibit 244, which is also in the middle bedroom, is a photo of the open desk drawer. And there's a notebook, colored pencils, and miscellaneous, miscellaneous items. Correct. You didn't open that notebook to see what was in it, correct? I personally did not know. You don't know if Mr. Crumbly knew what was in that notebook, is that correct? I, I, mean, I wouldn't be able to say. You would have no way of knowing, is that right? I, I don't know. Yeah. Exhibit 245 um, is a picture of the bed. I'm sorry, it's a picture of another notebook in the desk. It's a, a green notebook, correct? Correct. Same questions. You didn't open that notebook. I personally did not open that notebook. You don't know what's in it? I do not know. Um, you don't know, you have no knowledge whether Mr. Crumbly knew it? I wouldn't be able to say one way or another. 246. Um, it's a photo of an empty bottle of Canada House whiskey next to the bed. Correct. You don't know how that bottle got there? That was there when we came in the house. Right. You have no knowledge of, of how it got there, who had it, who put it there. You have no idea. You just know that it was there. Correct. Exhibit 220 is a, a picture, I believe, also of the, maybe the, this is a second bedroom. So I believe this is the north bedroom. Um, exhibit 220 is a picture of the bed. Mm -hmm. And that would be, is that a yes? Yes. Okay. And that would be uh, Mr. Crumbly's son's second bedroom. That's what it's been referred to, correct? Correct. Right. Exhibit 240, I believe it's 247, I can't think of my own writing, is a, a notebook that's open on the bed. You recall seeing that photo? Correct. And inside that notebook, there are photos of gun drawings. Correct. That notebook from 247, if you recall, is the same notebook from 220. If you'd like to see the photos, I can I can. Yeah, so in all honesty, I didn't have a ton to do with those notebooks. Um, I recall seeing those in there. I don't know where that one came from. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. If you recall from Exhibit 220, the notebook is closed or, or not displayed open, and it's under some items on the bed, if you recall. Correct. So you didn't open that notebook. You didn't go through that notebook. You have no knowledge of what was in that notebook other than what's in the photo. Yeah, I didn't personally at that, that, that time go through the notebook. And again, through your involvement in this case, you, you have no knowledge whether Mr. Crumbly was aware of what was in any of those notebooks. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. And Exhibit 235 is the, that is the gun safe, or I'm sorry, that is after you remove the gun safe from the TV stand in the cover. Uh, yeah, I saw a lot of, I don't know what picture you're referring to, I'm sorry. Yes, let me see there. if I can find it. Are you, are you referring to the one that was recovered in the kitchen? No, this is the actual gun safe that was recovered in the, actually, you know what, let me do it this way. I have yeah, a hard copy of it. Okay. It'll be easier for me to get to. May I approach, Your Honor? Sure. Thank you. I might also ask about 236, so I'm going to bring the both of you. Okay. You're welcome. Yeah, so 235 is the picture of the the, the master bedroom. It's the dresser that, where the gun safers are covered from. At this point, the gun safe had been removed. And all of this that you're seeing in the magazines, the uh, gun holster and the bullets in the background were below that safe that we took out from there. And those magazines, the two magazines, those were empty. They were. They just said below there, underneath on the lower shelf. Yeah, no, so the, the gun safers are covered on me on top of all that. Oh, so at this okay. point, this picture is showing once the gun safe has been taken out. Yeah, and that's below that. And 236, take a look at 236. That's a picture of the 
magazines and ammunition that was removed from that cupboard, correct? Yeah, so at this point, everything was taken out and photographed on top of that TV stand there. It's the two, it's the two magazines, the, mag, or the bullets inside the bag, even the box that the ammunition was in. And I just wanted to confirm that those were the same magazines that were inside the cabinet. Yeah, correct. So those were empty? They were empty. May I go, Sharon? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. When you were discussing Exhibit 256 with the prosecution, the prosecutor specifically asked you if there were no other locking mechanisms found in the home. Do you remember that question? I do. You arrived at the home after, if you recall, after 2 p.m. on November 30th of 2021. Yeah, it was short. It was around the time of the first video we saw. I don't know the exact time, but around the first time of the video we saw. Mm -hmm. So it's fair to say you have no knowledge of what was in that house prior to your arrival at approximately 250 on November 30th of 2021. Yeah, I can only speak to what I saw when I went inside the residence. I don't know what was there prior. You can't say whether or not there were any additional locking mechanisms in the house that morning. Is that fair? You have no knowledge of that. Again, yeah, I can only speak to what I saw and what I found. I, I don't know what was there prior. Exhibit 260. You went through some photos of video games. 257 was some video game, um, the gaming system. 258 were video games. 259 was more video games. 260, if you recall, and I can I can hand you the exhibit if you'd like, was Call of Duty and a game you weren't familiar with, Attack of Titan, Attack on Titan? Correct. Did you need to look at that exhibit? No, I didn't. Okay. Call of Duty, you saw, based on your testimony, it sounded like you were a little familiar with Call of Duty. Yeah, I, I don't play video games, but obviously I'm familiar with just with seeing commercials and I'm aware of what Call of Duty is. Okay. And on the front, of, on, the, on the cover, it has WW2 for World War II. Is that correct? Correct. Call of Duty, you would agree, is a, is a military, a type of military video game. Correct. It's a, what would be described as a first-person shooter uh, video game. Correct. And if you know, and if you don't, please tell me you don't know. A person playing Call of Duty is a, a, a person holding a firearm in the video game and engaging in combat. If you know. I, I, honestly, I, I, I'm probably the last person who tested out video games. I don't play video games. Um, I, I don't know. But to your knowledge, it is a military video game, which is a first-person shooter military video game. Correct. At the end of your direct testimony, you discussed that the prosecutor asked you if James Crumbly's phone was seized. Correct? Correct. Now, there are a couple of different ways that law enforcement can obtain somebody's cell phone. Would you agree with that? Correct. You can get a, a, a search warrant and take it from them, right? Correct. They can hand it to you, right? Correct. Um, you can say something like, you can give it to me or we'll get a search warrant, and they can hand it to you, right? Correct. In this case, if you recall, at some point, Mr. Crumley did not have his cell phone because he said, I need to get my cell phone back, correct? While in the back of a patrol car. Correct. At some point, he got his cell phone back. I, I don't. I didn't have any exchange with him after that about the cell phone. Honestly, I don't know okay. if he got it back. Now, do you recall that? If, if you're not aware, just let me know. Are you aware that there was some conversation about James and his wife giving their phones to law enforcement and then having to obtain some sort of another phone to be able to communicate with their family? Yeah. So at some point, uh, Lieutenant Marsden showed up at 112th Street and um, he had a conversation with. Uh, James and Jennifer about the cell phones. I don't know the specific language of the search warrant, but um, the phones were given to Marge Van, who then he provided to me and my partner, and we took them back to high school. And if you recall, there was also some discussion about how James and Jennifer could obtain kind of a temporary phone so that they would be able to communicate with people while law enforcement had their phones, if you recall. Yeah, that was a conversation I had with Lieutenant Mars Van. Uh, I don't remember the specifics of the conversation, but I know they did have a conversation about the phones. Okay, so you just know that there was a conversation that occurred where it was discussed with James and Jennifer how to obtain like a temporary phone, like a track phone or something like that. I don't know the specifics of the conversation. I just know that they did have a conversation about it. Okay, thank you. No further questions. Yeah. Just quickly, thank you. Uh, Detective, did James ever once tell you that the six hour nine millimeter used to commit the Oscar High School shooting was ever locked up? He did not. Okay. Nothing really. Well, you need to step down. Um, who's the who's the next one? Can I check on the hall of record for judges? Yeah, can you get us to the link here to the right here? Okay. Is it long? Long short? It's shorter than this, but I think we're signaling to leave right.
I'm just skipping through the breaks so that it kind of goes a little bit faster. And I know this is recorded in last time that I did go live. Um, but today I had to go in for a person that has been sick for a couple days. They have gotten the flu or whatnot. So I had to go in and make sure that the preschoolers had a teacher today. So thank you guys for being very understanding. All right. <coughs> Yes, yes. Next one is Dave Henry. Yes, which topic? Easy to confuse. So. David Hendrick, D A D I D H E N D R I C K. Go ahead, Mr. Wilson. Thank you. Sir, how are you employed? Uh, as a part time employee with the Oakland County Sheriff's Office. Okay, and how long have you been part time? Two days. All right. <laughs> and prior to that part time employment, did you work full time with the Oakland County Sheriff's Office? I did. And how long did you spend as a full time employee? 34 years. And at some point, did you retire from full time employment? I did. When was that? Uh, last May. Okay, so you didn't stay retired long? No. All right. In your 34 years working with the Sheriff's Office, could you tell us, please, what sort of assignments you have? Uh, my last assignment uh, that I had prior to retiring was the uh, Sergeant of the Fugitive Apprehension Team. Uh, prior to that, I worked about 10 and a half years in our Special Investigations Unit. Uh, prior to that, I worked in our Auto Theft Unit. Uh, all those were as sergeants. Okay. Uh, prior to getting to promote a sergeant, I worked in our Auto Theft Unit as a deputy uh, and at one of the substations as a uh, substation detective for a few years. Okay, the Special Investigations Unit, that's what Detective Lieutenant Tim Willis has up right now, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, I want to talk to you specifically about your time with the Fugitive Apprehension Team. First of all, tell us what exactly that is. It's a team that consists of uh, a sergeant and seven detectives who are responsible for locating people with felony warrants or who are wanted uh, for serious crimes that they have uh, been alleged to commit. Um, those requests that come in are either from our substations at the Sheriff's Office or uh, other agencies throughout the county that request our assistance. Okay. And Forgive me if I've asked this, but how long did you spend with the Fugitive Apprehension Team? Uh, about six and a half years. Okay, and that was as the sergeant? Yes, sir. So you would be the individual leading the team? That's correct. All right. And how many members of the Fugitive Apprehension Team were there? I had seven plus myself. Okay. Is that the role that you had in November and December of 2021? It is. Is it fair to say that all of the individuals on the Fugitive Apprehension Team work as a group? Yes. All right. Now, I want to direct attention to the days after the Oxford High School shooting on November the 30th, 2021. First of all, do you remember that day? I do. Were you working that day and that week? Uh, not that specific day. I was out of town, but the rest of the week, yes. Okay. At some point, were you requested to locate James and Jennifer Crumber? We were. Can tell us how that happened? I believe it was December 2nd. Uh, Lieutenant Willis asked me to attempt to locate both of them. Okay. And if I told you they were formally charged on Friday, December 3rd, did that sound right? Yes. Okay. So Detective uh, um, Willis sitting at the table here asked you to locate them? Yes. What information did you have at your disposal when you were given this assignment? They're basic information. They're uh, pictures, full names, height, weight, addresses, vehicles that drove, things of that nature. Okay. Were you made aware that there was 
phones were seized on the evening of November the 30th? Yes. Okay, so tell us please, what did you and your team do to attempt to locate the defendant? Uh, we began looking at uh, and conducting surveillance at their residence. Um, any family members that we knew of, friends, things of that nature, checked uh, area hotels, places that we might think they might go. Okay. And did you locate them? You were given this assignment on December the 2nd, you said? Yes. Did you locate them that, that day? We did not. Were you able to identify where they were had stayed from November the 30th until that point in time? Uh, we had identified a hotel that had stayed there. I don't specifically remember the, the name of the hotel, but okay. any hotel. That's fine. Um, when you received that information, what did you do? We uh, checked with the, the hotel staff to find out whether there were still guests there, whether they had checked out, and in fact, they had checked out. Okay. So after you learned that they had checked out from that hotel, what happened next? We continued to check area hotels, uh, surveillance of any known locations, and eventually we located a vehicle that belonged to them at a hotel in Auburn House. Okay. And when you identified this vehicle belonging to either James or Jennifer Crumbly, what happened next? We, we, I pulled all of the team to that location and we began uh, constant surveillance on that vehicle uh, to check and see if they would come back forward. Was that on Thursday, December the 2nd or Friday, December the 3rd? That was on Friday, December the 3rd. Okay. And did either the defendant or his wife come back to the vehicle? They did not. All right. And tell us, please, what's happening at that point in time? Uh, at that point, we're still, we're still trying to locate them. We're still, uh, again, checking anything, um, social media, anything we can find to, to try to locate them. Okay. And were you able to at that point? No, we did not. All right. Tell us what happened next. Uh, at some point late in the evening, and I don't remember the exact time, we were made aware that their other vehicle had been located in a parking lot by the Detroit Police Department. Okay, so this is late in the evening on Friday, December the 3rd? Correct. Okay. Did you come to learn that they were formally charged at noon on December the 3rd? Yes. Okay, so earlier that same day? Correct. All right. Um, when you learned that, that they were charged, what did you do personally? Myself and one of the other detectives uh, went to what we learned was their attorney's office and checked the office parking lot or surrounding parking lots to see if their vehicle might be there. By chance, they would be in the office of the attorney. Uh, upon not finding the vehicle, uh, we went in and made contact with one of their attorneys. Okay. Um, without telling us what was said in that conversation, um, did you find other James or Jennifer Crumbly there? Did not. Okay. And at that point in time, they had the same attorneys, is that correct? It's my understanding, yes. Okay. And so that was, would that have been before noon on December the 3rd or after noon December the 3rd? It was after noon. Okay. So after they were charged? Yes. All right. Um, and backing us up a little bit in the timeline, it was after that that the, the vehicle belonging to one of the defendants was recovered? Yes, several hours later. Several hours later. Okay, thank you. Um, later that evening, Friday, December 3rd, what did you learn? That the vehicle was located in the parking lot in the business in Detroit. Okay. So another vehicle belonging to either James or Jennifer Crumbly was located in Detroit? Correct. All right. Tell us what happened next. At that point, I left one person sitting on the vehicle in Auburn Hills, just by chance they came back to it, and the rest of the team and myself went to Detroit to uh, attempt to locate them somewhere in the area of the vehicle. Okay. The law enforcement personnel involved in this endeavor, was it contained to just the seven of you? No, sir. Okay. Tell us what you encountered when you went to the location where the vehicle was found. Uh, originally, when we got there, there were several Detroit police officers that had the street blocked um, and had the car secured in the parking lot. Uh, as we Search the area because we had no idea whether they had walked away from the cars or in the building. We didn't know at that point. So we were searching the area. More and more law enforcement officers arrived. Officers from the U.S. Marshals arrived to assist us. The Border Patrol, uh, the Michigan State Police, more Detroit Police all arrived on scene. Okay. After the exterior of the location was, was searched, and I take it no one was found then? Correct. Okay. What happened next? We formulated a plan to begin searching the building. It was a three-story industrial building. We had several officers on site, so at that point we decided to begin going room to room and search the entire building. Okay. I'm going to show you what's been admitted as People's Exhibit 307. This is a photograph, sir. Do you recognize what's in this photograph? I do. And tell us how. That is the industrial building where the uh, vehicle was located in the parking lot. Okay. So the parking lot would be behind this chain link fence? Do you yes. write the photograph? Correct. Okay. And did you and your team participate in the physical search of the interior of this building? We did. Okay. And now, contained to the interior of the building, again, was it just the seven of you or other law enforcement personnel involved as well? Oh, several law enforcement officers. Okay. Tell us about it, please. Uh, it, the plan was formulated that the Detroit Police Department would search the first floor of the building. Uh, the rest of the teams that were there, we took on the task of searching the second and third floor 
Oh, no. Okay. Now, was this done in secret or is this out in the public as far as the knowledge? Oh, no, it was it was uh, very obvious, very apparent. Uh, there was dozens and dozens of officers. Uh, we went room to room. Um, at some point, we had obtained keys to some of the rooms. When we had those keys, we were able to unlock the door, announce our presence, go in and search every place in the room that could potentially hide a human being. Uh, other rooms we did not have keys for, and we were forced to force our way into those rooms. When you say force our way into the rooms, can you describe what that looks like? Yeah, there are, there are several tools uh, that are used to what's called breach or force a door open. Uh, there is a long halogen type pole that a fireman would use. You jam it into the door frame and pry the door back and get the lock to sometimes pop. If that doesn't work, we have a, a 35 pound battering ram and we will batter uh, the door lock mechanism until the door opens. Okay. Is that a quiet endeavor or is that loud? Oh, it's very noisy. Very noisy. So, specific to the three floors in what's the building depicted here in 307, which areas did you and your team search? The second and third floor. Okay. And was anybody located in those searches? Not on the second or third floor. Okay. At some point, were you made aware that James and his wife were found on the first floor? Yes. Were you involved in the actual um, breaching of that room in the arrest? No, that was handled by the Detroit um, SWAT team, I believe, handled that. Door. Okay. And they had already been assigned to the first floor? Yes, sir. Okay. And tell us what happened after that, after that group. As soon as uh, the SWAT team entered that room and searched it and discovered uh, the crumblings in that room, they were turned. They were taken into custody by Detroit, and then they were turned over to my team, who took custody of them and transported them back up here to Oakland County. Okay. Do you recall the approximate time that occurred? Uh, probably 1.30, 1.15, somewhere. It was after 1 o'clock in the morning. In the morning. So we're talking Saturday, December the 4th. Yes, sir. And is James Crumbling Portrait? He is. Can you please point to describe something for you today? Great suit and headphones. Your Honor, would the record reflect the dedication of the defendant? The record was so well. Thank you. Nothing further. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Your involvement began on December 2nd of 2021. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. You were out of town on November 30th. Is it safe to say you were aware of the shooting that occurred at Oscar High School on November 30th prior yes. to your involvement? Yes. Now, your involvement was as the sergeant of the fugitive apprehension team. Correct. It's also called FAT. Is that correct? Correct. You testified that it, that that unit is responsible for locating people with felony warrants or wanted for serious crimes. Correct. Your unit did not get involved in all felony warrant arrests. Is that fair? I'm not sure. I'm still sure. All felony warrant arrests in Oakland County. Your unit did not go and, and arrest everybody who has a felony warrant. Is that fair? That's fair. Okay. And you didn't. Your unit did not get involved with all crimes that people were arrested for. Is that fair? That's fair. And let me clarify. So we know, and we heard some testimony previously, that there was um, a warrant issued by the court, correct? Correct. In this case, correct? And based on your experience, you were a law enforcement officer for 34 years. You were a detective for a number of years. You know that um, somebody who's accused of a crime in charge can can walk himself into a court, correct? Correct. With or without an attorney, right? Correct. Um, and then accused for felonies. Correct. Um, their attorney, you're aware that there have been times where their attorney has arranged, sometimes with the detective, sometimes with the prosecutor's office, in various ways. Their attorney can arrange for them to be turned in to the court or the police department on a specific day and time. Is that fair? Sure. Um, the other ways are involving your, your former unit. Correct. Um, and that's done by law enforcement. They, the attorneys don't call you up and say, hey, can you come get my client? That's the police who say, go get this person. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously other agencies can get involved with, with our other arrests as well. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. In this situation, your involvement was requested prior to Mr. Crumbly being charged. Yes. You testified that your involvement was December 2nd of 2021. Yes. You were contacted, and I don't know if this was clear, you were contacted by Detective Willis, I'm sorry, Lieutenant Willis. Yes. He contacted you on December 2nd of 2021 and asked you to locate James and Jennifer Crumley. Yes. Now, did you learn as part of your involvement or as part of getting that initial information that there were some concerns? Well, let me go back. You're aware that after the Oxford High School shooting that people were, were scared. Is that fair? I'm talking people in general. Possibly. I, I would assume. Angry. Sure. Upset. Sure. It was very public what had happened on November 30th of 2021. Yes. 
the shooter's name became public shortly after the shooting. Yes. If you recall, and you may not know, but if you don't know, please please say you don't know, um, that Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly's residence was made public. For that I don't. Did you learn during your involvement in this case that there were some concerns over the safety of James and Jennifer Crumbly because they were the parents of the Oxford High School shooter? I was never made aware of that. So all you were made aware of was that James and Jennifer Crumbly needed to be located? Yes. And the first place you went was their residence? Yes. They weren't there? Correct. You eventually determined and learned that they had been at a hotel um, in Auburn Hills from November 30th to December 3rd, the morning of December 3rd. I'm not sure if they were there that entire time, but that's where we ended up finding the vehicle was out. And did you also learn through your involvement that they registered at that hotel in Jennifer Crumley's name? I don't specifically remember whose name. So you began looking for James and Jennifer Crumley before they were formally charged? Correct. Now, have you, I assume in your career you've been involved in what would be considered high profile media cases, is that correct? Yes. And oftentimes in those cases, is it standard practice for your department to take someone into custody before the actual charges are announced? Depends on the crime and the circumstances surrounding it. Um, your department often, and correct me if I'm wrong, but your department will often assume that a high profile case or a serious offense that somebody might run. Uh, it is a possibility, people do. You had no information that James Crumbly had indicated that he was going to run away or flee or anything like that, is that fair? On December 2nd of 2021. That's fair. You were aware that James and Jennifer Crumley did not have their phones after November 30th of 2021 because they had been either given to or taken by law enforcement, but law enforcement had them in their possession. Yes. Did you also learn during your early involvement in this case or at, or at any point that James and Jennifer Crumley had obtained um, track phones or pay, pay, pay to go phones or things like that? Yes. And did you learn during your involvement in this case that those phones were obtained because James and Jennifer wanted to be able to contact family um, in the early days after the shooting? I was not uh, aware of the reason behind obtaining those phones. Did you also learn during your um, during your involvement in this case that James and Jennifer Crumley obtained uh, additional phones in the same phone number of the phones that were given to law enforcement? I did learn that, but I don't remember at what point in our investigation. Said that charges were formally announced at approximately noon on December 3rd of 2021. That's what you're saying, yes. You do not know whether or not James and Jennifer knew that those charges had been formally announced. Is that fair? That's fair. You said that you went to James and Jennifer's attorney's office and you talked to an attorney. I did. That was not me, correct? It was not. Some hours later, you were notified that um, that one of their vehicles was located in a business parking lot in Detroit. Correct. It was not a parking garage, is that fair? Yes. It was not underground parking? No. It was not indoor parking? No. It was in a, a gated parking lot. We can see the fence in, in the photo, correct? Correct. There weren't boxes or, or branches or anything covering the vehicle. The vehicle was in the parking lot. Correct. And at some point during your involvement between December 2nd and December 3rd, did you also, were you also made aware that that there were going to be some attempts to to do an alternative to what we talked about earlier when it comes to turning somebody in, that that um, that Mr. Crumley may be walking himself into the arraigned on the warrant after he'd been made aware of it, if you recall those conversations. I had, I had conversations with an attorney, but I'm not sure what I can go into. Yes, and I'm not asking you about the details of the conversation. Just if you had some knowledge that that there were that there was an indication that Mr. Crumbly was was not running, but that he was in fact going to turn himself in again without giving. Yeah, I'm to object to this whole line of questioning. I think it's getting close to speculating what the purpose of what a hearsay conversation would be. And it could open the door to other things. Oh, yeah, I, I can open the door to that. I can move on, Judge. At no point during your involvement in this case were you told. James Crumbly is absolutely avoiding these charges and will not be turning himself in. At no point were you told that. There's the same question, same objection to the same question. Just asked differently. Well, and who, who is he being told that by? It could be anybody, Your Honor. His, his involvement was requested by Lieutenant Willis. He had multiple police officers involved. There were multiple people involved in, in allegedly or in locating Mr. Crumbly. I'm just asking if he was ever given knowledge that that, that was going to happen. Just as a, as a response, he's testified to what his job was. He was given an assignment and he carried it out. Well, I don't know. I guess you had to be careful with the wish for. Right. Thank you, Jess. Yeah. You know. 
you indicated that the building where Mr. Crumbly's vehicle was, was a quote unquote three story industrial building, as I believe what you called it. Yes. That was exhibit 307, which is on the screen. In that building, obviously from the outside, it looks kind of like a warehouse. Would you agree with that? Sure. But you learned during your involvement that there were multiple tenants in that building. Yes, multiple suites. Right. Rooms. Businesses. Yes. Um, people who were regularly in and out of that building. That I can't answer. It was very late and there was nobody in and out when we were there. Okay. Did you learn during your involvement that there were people in and out during the day that day? Not at the time I was there. Okay. And you may not be the right witness to ask these questions up. I'm just trying to determine what exactly you knew about this building. Yeah, at that point, at that hour of the night, there was nobody coming in and out. And we wouldn't have allowed anybody to come in or out. Anyway. And you learned in going into the building that there was an option for interior parking. Did you learn that? Um, I don't recall there being the interior parking, like a parking garage. If that's what you mean. Right. Like a way to pull a vehicle in through a garage and park it inside instead of out in the, in the lot. There was a loading dock, so I guess technically you could have pulled a car inside of there, but but I did not see. But it was not a designated indoor parking structure. Right. So not like a parking garage or, or those underground parking like we were talking about earlier. Correct. Okay. Your testimony was that it was obvious and apparent what was going on outside of and in that building during your search of the building, correct? Yes. Now, you can't say because you, you really have no idea what James Crumbly heard or saw that night, correct, on December 3rd of 2021, or the early morning hours of December 4th of 2021. I can only tell you what I saw and heard in the commotion, the law enforcement officers, the, the flashing lights from the police cars, but specifically as to what he saw or I can't tell you. Right. You have no knowledge of whether or not he saw or heard any of that. Is that fair? Yeah. You were not part of the arrest of James Crumbly after entry was made by DPD's SRT unit, correct? Correct. I know where the question is going. Thank you. <clears throat> Sir, who are you giving this assignment by? <clears throat> okay. And you were asked to locate James Crumbly on December the 2nd and arrest him on December the 2nd. Is that correct? Correct. And this, that's not uncommon for an officer in charge to contact the fugitive apprehension team to locate a suspect, is it? No, that's not uncommon at all. Okay. And the goal as a member of the fugitive apprehension team is a peaceful surrender? Yes. Okay. Is that why you reached out to Mr. Crumbly's attorneys? Absolutely. Okay. And there were no arrangements made to you to turn the defendant in on Friday, December the 3rd, were there? No. No. Nothing. Right. Uh, you can step down here, Yes, we sell to you know about 100 different businesses around Metro Detroit, so coffee, tea, products like that. And then uh, we have our own cafe up at uh, Somerset Mall as well. And where's your business, the, the roasting and importing, where's it located? So the roasting and importing side of things, uh, all the manufacturers done at uh, 1111 LG Street in Detroit. In Detroit. And can you tell the jury about what area that is in Detroit? Yes, yeah, so it's in a neighborhood called Island View, which is like mostly industrial buildings. Um, it's basically situated a block off of where Bell Isle is located. So generally East Detroit is kind of the consideration here. Okay. Um, and I want to draw your attention to November 30th of 2021, uh, was your business at that location at that time? Yes. And were, were you residing near or around your, your business? Yeah. At the time I was living, um, I mean, maybe a mile away, pretty close up. Okay. And just, let's just take a, a, a moment and can you just, can you tell the jury what this building um, is how much of a space you occupy and what it's used for. Sure. So um, it's an industrial building that was built in around the 1920s. Originally, they built like pickup trucks or something inside of there, but um, now the current owner has it basically for different um, tents. You know, so we occupy about 3,000 square feet in the building. I'd say there's probably five to 10 different tenants who rotate in and out every now and then. Uh, the building itself is basically um, split up into like one, one to 2,000 square foot 
units and sell. Um, so at any time, you know, I'd say there's on average 10 tenants in that building um, at any given time. And are they all um, the same type of, of tenants? No, 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 all completely different people. Like our neighbors, uh, they like breed rare plants, okay. uh, tons of different stuff. All right. Um, and on the first floor, is that where you are? Yes. All right. Mm -hmm. Who else is on the first floor, if you know? So there's the rare plant uh, place. And then uh, there's uh, somebody who packages like fine art. Um, there is a, there's a painter who uh, does just like hobbyist work. And then I think that's it for us on the first floor. I don't know if there was somebody else in there at the time, but I think it was just that floor. Okay. How do you enter the, well, we just heard testimony that they're about parking. Um, our former uh, witness wasn't sure. Can you tell the jury whether there was parking within or outside of uh, the, the building? Yeah, so you can park in three, space, or three I would say designated areas uh, for the building. There's one on one side of the building. There's another on the other side. Both of those entrances are gated, so you have like a little, you know, fob uh, to open the gate, garage opener, garage Which opener. Which tenant has a fob? Uh, yeah, well, they, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say every single one does, but usually if you ask, uh, you know, the property manager can approve that if you want. Uh, and then people generally park on the street as well. Um, now there's like a, a dirt lot across the street that people park at the time of this. Uh, that was not their land, so. And was, was there indoor parking? Uh, no, there's not designated indoor parking, though um, some tenants have garages. Okay, let me, where... let me ask it a different way, because it's it's relevant to what sure. was happening that night. Do you use that building space for anything other than your, just your business? So on the third floor of the building at the time, um, I used our garage storage area to put one of my cars away. All right, mm -hmm. and just briefly, because it, it relates, what, yeah. what's your relationship with cars? Okay, so uh, I just... Uh, Here, I, I, I could have to the relevance. Um, yeah, I'm, if I could just respond, I'm, um, can I just respond, please? Mm -hmm. uh, in a moment, I'm going to ask him about identifying the car and how he was able to identify that car. Um, I, I think most people wouldn't have been able to, so I'm, I'm just trying to lay a, a foundation. Well, based, based on the analogy of previous testimony, I'm, I'm going to allow that. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, so I'm just a general car enthusiast. I think I, you know, I've been obsessed with cars ever since I was a kid. And uh, at the time, I had two or three cars, and one of them... Uh, I, it was like a nicer one, so I put it away. You know, I didn't leave it on the street where my house was because I had street parking. So I had one of my cars that got like hit. You know, the mirror got pulled off, so I obviously didn't want that to happen to a nicer car. So um, on the third floor, we have a garage, and so I pull that in during uh, you know the nighttime or any time I don't plan on enjoying it, driving it. Um, okay. When, so uh, I can drive my all right, thank you. Uh, so is there any need? Was there any vendor or vendor type um, businesses in that building? And the reason I ask is. Is it a place where customers would come and park and open to the public? Uh, I, I would say that it's generally not um, like a public building. There's not um, present retail in the building. There's not like, for example, our grocery doesn't have a coffee shop or any cafe component. It's strictly like a you know business okay. um, for manufacturing. And when you switched the car that, that night, do you remember, did you go, and, and were you at the, the warehouse that night at a, at later in the evening? Yes. Um, do you remember about what time it was? Uh, probably around 10 p.m. And is that something you would routine, routine, routinely do at night because of the, the situation with your cars or Objection. that? Objection, meeting. I, I just tried to get I, out. Or, so that wouldn't be a leading question. Why are you there at night? Um, to, to switch the cars. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. Uh, so, um, talk to me or tell the jury what, if anything, you knew about the, the Oxford shooting or the crumblies that that sure. is. yeah so i was uh, generally aware of obviously the news that had happened you know i read the news about the shooting uh, which i think everybody in michigan really kind of heard those heard what had happened at that point um early in the day i remember seeing a uh, a poster about um you know the parents being on the run and okay so, you're you're gesturing your hand and when you say poster um and first do you remember was that november 30th of, uh, what, what day was that I, I assume it was the same day that um this happened okay well let day. me back up sure. the same day that they were charged or the same day that the event happened the, Objection, Your Honor. I, I don't think that there's been testimony that mr Kirtley is aware of when they were charged okay uh, she's trying to he said he said the same day that this happened so she's clarifying if he means the encounter the at and bellevue or that is the shooting mm -hmm. the encounter oh, okay uh, do you remember the actual day that you that this occurred that night uh the 30th of november i believe that was the shooting do you remember uh, the date and what date it was if i said december 3rd does that make sense to you it seems it seems correct i don't okay. know like if i remember it off the top of my head these okay. days. backing up you were motioning to your hand and saying poster and uh -huh. i and what, what so, uh, i saw it on facebook okay uh -huh. and what did you see so it was a poster um it was a essentially like a wanted poster so there were pictures of uh um, you know parents a picture of the car the license plate was on there and then um yeah, i think just general information about what had happened were you aware that law enforcement was looking for the crumbles? Yes. And uh, do you remember about what time 
he arrived that that evening. Uh, around 10 p.m. Okay. And uh, tell the jury what, if anything, you saw when you entered the, the parking space. Is it Well, first of all, mm -hmm. when you go there at that time of day, is there usually anybody in the parking lot? Uh, not really. There's a couple tenants who like leave their cars there. Um, there's like a work van from the work company. Um, but generally, there's not like many vehicles that hang out in that lot. Okay. So you drive into the parking lot, and mm -hmm. what do you see? So originally, um, so I drove into, if you're facing the front of the building, uh, I always park on the right side, so there's two lots left, right? Um, and I just have a box for the right lot. It's two different ones. So I pulled in, um, was just doing my thing. Generally, um, there's some cars there. So, you know, when I saw this car that was backed into the spot in the corner, originally I didn't pay any mind to it. Okay, when you say this car, what do you mean? So you, sure, drove you did see a car? I did see a car. Okay, yeah. and so was, where it was. Yeah, so it was back in the, it was like front facing the front of the lot, it's a rectangular lot, and it was in the back right corner. Um, so probably the furthest spot from the, the building entrance in the area. And was it backed in with the front out, or was it the other way? It was backed in with the front out. Okay. And what else did you see? Um, so I saw that car there, but originally, you know, didn't pay too much attention to it, and then walked into the building. And then when I walked out of the building uh, was when I was really kind of like met face-to-face -face with the front of the car. And that's when I remember, um, you know, the original wanted poster I saw, you know, I, being like a car enthusiast, I saw that, and it just kind of stuck with me. It was like a newer Kia. So I had just not seen that car in person before. So like when I saw it, I was like, oh, that's a new Kia. And when I saw it, it's like, oh, that's like that new Kia. You know, so like, you can tell by looking at the, the front of the car it was that it was a new Kia? Yeah, so if you looked at the like poster, it was like that stock image of the car. You know, you see like on websites and everything. It, um, so it's obviously the front of the car. And it was this, I believe it was the same exact color too um, on the poster. So when I saw it, I was like, oh, like I remember where I saw this from. Okay, one more. Yeah. All right. So, what did you what did you do next when you came out and? <laughs> yeah. So, um, when I saw the car, I was like, okay, that's. I remember seeing that. I pulled up the poster on my phone, and when I was doing that, I was walking to the back of the car to check the plate because I remember seeing the plate on the actual, um, you know, poster. And so, I walked around the car with my flashlight on, uh, and then you know, obviously, it hit me when I saw like the license plate on the ad, and then I was standing in front of the license plate too. Uh, but yeah, so basically, I pulled up um, the wanted post poster and subsequently was walking around the car. And did the license plate match? It did. And did you see anything else of significance in the um, back of the car? So when I was looking at the back of the car, um, I had then noticed uh, there was a person sitting next to the car. There's like an elevated curb that kind of sits behind where this car was, and it's uh, like protects like a little garden area. And so somebody was sitting on the curb with their hood up. It was like a blue plaid hoodie. And uh, I didn't, you know, when I was walking through the car, I didn't see anybody. And also it was dark. So, you know, I wasn't expecting to see anybody really. I thought it was just like a car at that time. Did you say anything, so, or did that individual see anything? No. Uh, <laughs> they stayed kind of like turned around uh, with their foot up. I saw them, and then I turned my flashlight off and headed back into the building. Okay. What did you do next? Uh, so I walked into the building, had quickly, briskly headed into my unit, locked all the doors. Uh, the lights were off at the time, so I cut the lights off, and then called 911. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you um, what's been marked as Exhibit 302. And uh, this is the security footage from your building. And how many cameras, if you know, does a building have? I don't know it's off the top of my head exactly, but I can tell you there's uh, one in like the center lobby area, kind of like the general promenade where most people congregate. Uh, there is one on the side of the building, one or two on the side that we're talking about, one on the front, maybe another one on the other side, but I don't like having them memorized. Okay, so um, I'm going to, we're gonna start this at 2256, which the actual time is 1034 p.m. And what are we looking at here, Luke? So uh, what we're looking at is the parking lot, uh, the parking lot that I am, that I parked my car in. And so this is, when I was talking earlier about facing the front of the building and looking backwards, this is um, the furthest from the front of the building. Okay, so. But this is attached to who, the building. Who is that right here? Um, I assume that this is the person that I saw in the blue plaid hoodie. Okay. And in this photo, um, where is the front, the entrance that you would have gone in? So where they just walked out of, so on okay. the right side of the screen. And eventually we're going to see you pull in. Will, will, will we see that at the top of the screen? Yes. Okay. Correct. Is that your car? Uh, I assume so. Uh, I'll know if I see the roof rack on it, uh, but the time, time checks out. Okay. Do you, do you see the, the Kia that you spotted in this image? Yeah, on the left side of here. Okay, it's kind of hard to see. Okay. Is 
Is that your car? Yes. And are you parking right in front of the entrance? Um, I mean, not like directly in front of the door, but you know, one, one of the two close spots. Yes. Stops? Okay. All right, we see, is, is that individual of you yes. at the right of the screen? Mm -hmm. And is that you going back into the building? Yeah. Okay, what's happening there? Um, Did you go out to your car to look at the car? Uh, no, I think that when I just, so I think this is when I just first noticed the car. Like, I think I just saw myself look over and just, yeah, what's up, okay. that jacks I was probably just grabbing something. Like that. All right, and that's you right there? Yes. Are you holding anything? Oh, uh, my phone. And for the record, this is around 23.04, which is actually 10.42. Yeah. And you're, are you walking at the same pace or a different pace than you? you Maybe, a little, relevance? Maybe a little quicker. I, I, the, I'm, I'm eliciting just general testimony what from a fat witness about his, what he observed. Okay, thank, thank you. Uh, so why are you walking at a faster pace? Uh, probably to, uh, I mean, probably a lot of emotions going on at that specific time. Uh, you know, I, at the time when I first went to the car, I didn't expect to see anybody. So when I did, I was like, okay, I want to get safe inside. Okay, and we're going to play exhibit 303, uh, which is the 911 call. Um, and were you feeling any emotions during that call? Uh, yeah, definitely, for sure. Uh, that's something that I feel like, well, I've personally never experienced before, is like that type of connecting the dots like that. Uh, and I hope everybody else doesn't. Okay. That's a lot. All right. Call one, call on Friday, December 3rd, 2021, 10 43 and 14 seconds p.m. Mr. 911, what is the address of the emergency? 1111 Delby Street. Repeat the address of that station. 1111 Street. Where's the Barclay Street? Uh, Lafayette and Albion. Tell me exactly what happened. Just, just looking, just who the people who, the parents of the shooter, that are running away, they're here. But I'm not sure what you're referring to, so yes, you want to take Tell me exactly what happened at the location, we're going on out. Okay, so the Oakland shooter, the kid, has the two parents. So I'm on the run right now, and it says, you know, also tell me that call if you see anything. And I just went to go park my car and switch it around and at my office and at my office. And there was a key that looked like their car. And I walked around and checked um, this license plate, and it's their car, and the, the woman is here next, next to the car. She drove it this way. Sitting next to her car in the parking lot. She's sitting next to her vehicle on the ground or in another vehicle on the ground. On the ground. Okay, what kind of vehicle is this then? It's a 2021 Kia, the black Kia SUV, in the parking lot. Was anyone inside of the vehicle? I don't know. You said if you walked around the vehicle and looked at that, you didn't? I walked, I walked back to um, look at the license plate because I saw online that that car was matching. Yeah, yeah, the plate number? Uh, one second. It's um, DQG 5203. What is the plate work? DQG 5203. Okay. And the vehicle is parked in a parking lot and a mother is home? Yes, of course. Okay. Uh, it's next to my car in a parking lot. I'm inside my office now. And the, and the mother is sitting on the ground. What is she wearing? Yes. She's wearing a hoodie. Uh, but I don't know what kind. What color is that? I, I don't know. I think it was planned, but I saw her for the and I like, ran inside. Uh, I, like, I don't know. You're not sure what color of hoodie you wear, but you're sitting there? Yes. Okay, thank you. As soon as you got inside? Uh, as soon as I, I got my office. Okay. So yeah, I did within 30 seconds. All right, and I want to go back to the previous video and finish that um, to show what happened after you went inside. Yes.
That's you, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. And what is that? You know. Uh, this is that? the person that I saw uh, walking into the building. So, if you asked me at the time. Um, that somebody was going to be walking in behind me, I would have told you no way. You know, the building is there's fobs for every door. Uh, so, like I said, you know, it's not a public building. And so, uh, when the officers came by, they asked me. You know, I was I was like, oh, they, they probably took off somewhere. And, uh, I would my confidence in them being inside of the building was, you know, the. You did I, not I, think they were inside. Whoever that correct. was. Yeah, I definitely didn't think that they were right behind. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, in the call, you stated it, you referred to the individual as female mm -hmm. and she. Yeah. Did you ever see the person's face? No, I didn't. They were turned to their back. I think it was just like. Generally, the, the figure of the person that I saw, uh, more or less. Okay. Um, what happened after you called 911? Um, so, you can see an officer in the top right getting there. So, that's pretty quick. Was it a few minutes? Yeah, a few minutes. minutes. It, it wasn't too bad, um, especially for Detroit response time. Oh, okay. So, the, when you come, or I came out and I actually met them out there because I saw their lights. Um, if it wasn't the siren, it was like one of their floodlights. And but when you someone. came out of the building, did you know where the individual was? No, okay. I did not. I assumed at the time they probably just took off. All right. Know, I was, uh, to be honest, I was surprised that the car was still even there. I thought they, like, okay. All right. Um, at some point, did more than just one officer arrive? Yeah, so there was one or two squad cars that showed up originally. And then, so there's a the second one right there. Uh, so I walked them through the building to get into the parking lot because the parking lot is closed. And I think once they kind of confirmed that the car was correct, uh, that's when uh, a lot more people showed up. What, what's a lot? 10 plus squad cars. All right. Mm -hmm. What? Where did you remain? Well, let me just, at what point was this over to the extent where you went home? How many? Oh, I was there for like two or three. Okay. Mm -hmm. And were you in the building the whole time? No, I was in the building for probably like an hour. Um, I was in my unit. Uh, and then they had questions. You know, I was talking with them a little bit. Uh, kind of just like generally floating between the front of the building and then inside my office. Um, and then they, I got me a squad car and they took me to what they call like a command post or something like that, um, where it was like a couple blocks away, they had set up like a central command, like HQ for other officers and stuff like that. At some point, did you learn whether or not the individuals were taken in custody? Yeah, uh, like way late in the night. Uh, did you did you learn where they were located? Yes, I did. They um, so they actually walked me, like they showed me where it happened. Where, where were they located? So the painter that I referenced earlier on this uh, testimony. We shared basically drywall with them, two pieces of drywall. So they were right in the unit adjacent to where ours is. And that unit, the, is that, that's on the first floor, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Correct, yeah. Where, does it have windows in it at all? It does, yeah. Uh -huh. And are they facing the parking lot? Or are they yeah, facing... so the, if you're facing the front of the building, my unit is on the right. It closes the right side of the building. And then there's another unit behind ours that also faces right in the parking lot. So this unit would have looked, um, and as it looks, it's not like a clear, perfectly clear window. It's like frosted, but uh, would have looked into the parking lot. All right. Mm -hmm. Did the did the law enforcement that showed up? Were they did, did they have lights and sirens? Were there any lights? Were there any yeah. sounds? Yeah, tons. Um, and you know, like we're pretty aware of what goes on, just given like the, the thinness of the walls. You know, there's no insulation between our walls. And then, um, you know, especially in that, you're aware of any lights that go down the street, uh, anything like okay, that. You mentioned but, the walls and the thin walls. What do you mean? Do you mean you're aware because of noise, because of um, what you see? Yeah, both. Uh, for I mean, for the walls, you know, we hear other units, other people, you know, in the building. Like I know when other people are in the building. Um, for sure. And the, Do you the just clear your testimony? You know they're in the building uh, because you can hear them, or you know they're in the building because you see them? Uh, are we talking about the officers in general? Or in general? Um, Hold on, just let me yeah, question. Yeah. This wall you share mm -hmm. is, what are, is what you're trying to say, that you can tell if somebody's in there even if you haven't seen them? Yeah, okay. you can hear them. Okay. I mean, if they're making if they're making noise. Okay. And when you were in the building for that hour, uh, was the building being searched, or were the, was law enforcement out in the parking lot? Uh, no, the building was being searched at that time. And what did you hear, if anything? Right. Uh, so I was in like the front of the building at the time. Uh, they were, I mean, they were definitely had guns drawn. You know, they were searching the building. They were announcing that they were there. Uh, they were definitely making a presence. Okay. Before this uh, day, um, which was um, in. December 3rd, I guess it was December late in the night. But yeah. before this occurred, um, had you ever seen anything discarded or left out in a hallway um, in the building? Oh, yeah. So uh, in the center promenade that I mentioned earlier about like where the camera is, there's um, people put like, I think, I don't know, people put things to give away there. And then also people like store things there for very short periods of time. At the time, there was like a new Tempur-Pedic mattress that was there, or new to me, you know, looking new. Um, and I was sitting up against the wall, and I was there for a while because somebody had like taped a note to it. That was like 
can I buy this from you? You know, whoever it was. And how long was it there? Days, weeks? Days. Oh. Yeah. Uh -huh. And um, why is the mattress significant to you? Um, so, well, so the mattress was um, taken into the unit. And I saw that afterwards. So I, uh, when they showed me the unit again, um, you could see that the mattress was then in there. Um, you know, I, I don't really know who actually owned the mattress, okay. even to this day. At some point, did you ever see the mattress again? Yeah, so then people, somebody, I don't know who, but somebody took it back out of the hallway. And I think whoever actually owned it uh, didn't want it anymore because it floated around like it was sometimes like in front of the unit that they were in and sometimes in the middle of the hallway, sometimes like on the floor. Like it, was, it was a very, um, yeah, it was very agnostic where it was for a while. And then I don't know what happened to it. Okay. Nothing for us. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So, excuse me, just one moment. So, you went to 1111 Bellevue on December 3rd of 2021 at approximately 10 p.m., from what you recall? Mm -hmm. Is that yes? Yes. Okay. yes. Um, if you say, mm, I might actually yeah, say yes. Time, sorry. Okay, that's okay. Um, you said that you described 1111 Bellevue as an industrial building that was once used for manufacturing. Yeah, in the 1920s. Right. So, yeah. On December 3rd of 2021, it was not a manufacturing building. Uh, no, there, I mean, there are individuals, tenants who do different types of manufacturing, like there's a millwork company. We I technically manufacture coffee, uh, but they're not manufacturing pickup trucks in the way that they were 100 years ago. Right. So in the 20s, it was used as, uh, as basically a, a truck factory. As far as I know. Okay. Yeah. But on December 30, 2021, it was a business building. Correct. Yeah. It was just industrial in style. Uh, yeah. The, yeah. Specifically the look of the building. Right. The look of the building was industrial, but it was not an industrial use building. Uh, I think it's technically zoned industrial still uh, to this day. I don't know if it's zoned mixed use, but I'm not, I'm not fully positive on the um, regulations and okay. the buildings. What we agree on is that they're not building pickup trucks, right? Correct. It's not abandoned. Correct. Um, there were multiple tenants in the building. Correct. Um, and there have been multiple tenants for quite some time, for what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. At least a couple of years. Okay. Your, where you roast coffee is approximately 3,000 square feet, is that correct? Yeah, so there's 2,000 square feet on the first floor and an additional 1,000 on the third floor. Okay, so the 2,000 square feet on the first floor is the is the space where you share the wall with the artist studio. Yes, correct. And then you have the 1,000 square feet on the floor, which is where you keep your cars. Uh, yeah, at the time, yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. There's also, um, you can drive your car in. In fact, in this video, we can see, I think we can see where your car is parked. And you can drive your car in to like a, is there like a garage door or so, something? So not in this. Um, so it's on the front of the building. There's a there's a uh, drive-in garage door. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and that's how people get to their various garages, is that? Uh, yeah, to say, I would say like they're not, there aren't any other garages in the space, but um, that's how people unload and load uh, their cars in there. You said that you were generally aware of the after high school shooting on December, I'm sorry, November 30th of 2021. Yeah. You had seen media reports, I'm sure. Yes. You'd read stuff on social media. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, you said that everyone knew what happened. Yeah. On December, on November 30th of 2021. Correct. Prior to December 3rd of 2021, you saw a poster, uh, a wanted poster on yes. social media. Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. And you saw it the day, you saw it on December 3rd of 2021. I believe so. And that poster had a photo of James and Jennifer Crumbly. Yes. Or photos of James and Jennifer mm -hmm. Crumbly. Yes. A photo of their vehicles. Yes. A license plate number. Yes. General information about the shooting. Yes. It indicated, I think your testimony was, it indicated that they were on the run. Um, yes. I think it was more of like a be on the lookout or a, a wanted poster generally. There was a reward offer, if you remember? I don't remember at the time. Your testimony was that the Kia, which we can see in the, on the left side of the frame, was parked the farthest from the building entrance. Do you remember that being your testimony? Yes. You also testified that there's actually a door on the right side of the frame in front of where your car is parked. Yes, I would say that um, the main entrance and then the uh, ancillary entrances, I'm speaking mostly in regards to the main entrance of the building, which is on the front. Okay, so there are multiple entrances to the building. Mm -hmm, there are, yes, there are three entrances to the building. Okay, so there wasn't just one way to get in on the front of the building, there was also the, the door right where your car is parked. And in fact, yes. we watched you walk into that door. Yes. You said that you walked up to the Kia on the left side of the frame, you walked around to the back, we watched you do that, correct? Yes. You confirmed the license plate number from yes. what was on the wanted poster on your social media. Yes. And then you saw someone sitting next to the car. Yes. If you recall, that person was smoking? Uh, I, d I don't recall. I don't. I saw that in other news articles and things like that. Um, but I, I did not say that or see that originally. Okay. You said you didn't expect to see anyone sitting outside the car? Yeah. You expected... Just to have the car there empty? I think for clarity, I didn't expect to see the car. 
or have the car be uh, a matching car in the first place. So there were a lot of unexpected things happening at that specific time, uh, but that's about it. You said that you wanted to get safely inside. Yes. You assumed that the person that you saw was dangerous? Uh, yes. That was based on what you had seen on the news and in media reports? Yes. Based on the wanted poster? Yeah, uh, maybe not particularly, I wouldn't say that like the poster said armed and dangerous or anything like that. I'm not 100% positive, uh, but I think generally in a situation like that, I would fear for my safety. Based on your own personal beliefs about the Oxford High School shooting and what you had heard in the media about James and Jennifer Crump? Yes. The person sitting outside the car did the same thing to you? They did not. They didn't say, hey, look away? No. They didn't was, say a word, right? There was no interaction between us. In Exhibit 303, you called, it was your 911 call. You recall that you told the 911 dispatcher that the parents were on the run? Yes. Um, and again, that was information that you had based on what you heard in the news and the media and yes. what you see on the line poster. The person that you encountered next to the Kia did say, hey, man, I'm, I'm running away. You, you said there was no encounter there at all. No interaction. Okay. Now, right around this time, time stamp, uh, 2306 on the video, which I believe is about 20 minutes earlier in real time, mm -hmm. um, the prosecutor pointed out that somebody walked across the parking lot after you entered the building. Yes. That person did run after you, correct? Uh, From no. what you saw in the video? Correct. They didn't chase you down? They did not. They didn't threaten you in any way? They did not. You didn't even know that they were there? Uh, I, obviously, I saw them. I didn't know that they followed me in. Correct. You didn't know that they walked in after you walked to the building? Correct. I think by the time I was in my unit, um, you know, I didn't hear the door shut. I didn't know if they, like, softly closed the door or anything, but um, I didn't know that they were in it. You had no knowledge that that person even entered the building? Correct. You then testified that there was about a couple minutes later, we watched, and, and I'll play the video, too. I just want to see. We'll play the video, too. A couple minutes after this, 2306, um, or a couple minutes after you called 911, the police showed up. Correct. So if you look at a timestamp right now, 2306.54, mm -hmm. and then it jumps to 2321. And then we play it for a little while, and we see what, what you believe was a patrol car out there outside the, the fence, correct? Yes. At 2321. Yes. So at that point, it had been just shy of about 20 minutes between you entering the building, at some point making a 911 call, and the police showing up. Uh, from from this, yeah. From this video. Yeah. Okay. I'd say my, my conception of time was probably a little skewed in that specific moment, just given the, the heightened senses, you know. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not yeah. asking you to lock into the time number in a couple of minutes. I'm asking, it actually was not just a couple of minutes. It was actually more than a couple of minutes. Sure. That's, that's all I'm asking. Sure. Okay. Now, I, I thought I heard you say this a couple of times, but I, I just want to clarify. You said that you were at the building for about an hour after you made your 911 call? Um, more or less, I'm not 100% positive exactly. Then you were driven to um, a temporary, what you call the command post? Yeah. That law enforcement had set up? Yeah, correct. I think there were, you know, there was media there. There was um, a bit more squad cars. There was like a massive blue bus for the police. And then, and this was the part that I wanted to make sure I heard you say correctly. And then the police took you back to this building and walked you through well, my the car scene. was there, so I had to get my car. And so um, when I was going through the building to get my car, um, they were, you know, there were a bunch of police in the building. And they were like, oh, this is what they were. And they allowed you to enter the scene? And no, I did not enter the scene. Okay. And that's what I was unclear about, because you you testified that you had seen the mattress in the unit after James and Jennifer Crumley Yeah, so, so when I walk through the center of the building, you have to turn right um, to exit through the to access this parking lot that's on the screen. And so to exit that, you have to pass by the door of um, where they were hiding. And so that door was open, so you could see the mattress. Okay. Now, you talked about what you heard while you were in the building. You said that you were at the front of the building while the police were searching the building? Uh, yeah, so I, like I said, I was generally kind of floating around, um, you know, because we have two, I have two doors on my building, or my unit, for example. I have, like, side doors and the front door, and so I was somewhere between those, or I was outside in the front. So you know what you heard and saw, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what you observed on your own? Yes. You have no knowledge of what James Crumbly heard or saw while the police were there? That's correct. I have no further questions, John. Yes, Tara, just briefly. Do people, um, <clears throat> is there any residential... Um, unit, and, and I guess what I'm asking is, do people sleep at the building? No, it's in, it's within the terms of my lease, at least, um, and generally I think it's one boilerplate lease that goes across all of them, uh, though that is an assumption that it is not allowed, uh, you're not allowed to sleep there. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, I want to play the video, just a portion of it, quickly. Um,
your testimony was that you never saw the front of this individual? That's right. But what, the, um, the actual piece of clothing, how did you describe it? Uh, in the, Judge Rauner, yes, and answer. How did you describe it? You said something in the 911 call. I said it was a plaid hoodie. Okay, do you know what color, do you remember what color it was? It, during the 911 call, uh, I didn't say. I think it might have been blue. Okay, That's not sure. Not 100% positive. Okay, um, and now I'm going to show you another image. Exhibit 304. First of all, is that the art studio, if you know? Uh, yeah, I've never been inside of it, but uh, like I said, when you pass the, to go to the parking lot or leave the parking lot, sometimes the door's open. So I know that there's like paintings in there and I know the general footprint of the okay. space, just given where it is. All right. Uh, do you, did you ever see uh, James or Jennifer Crumbly other than? No, okay. only the, the, obviously the scenes that next to the car, but when they were arrested and taken away, I wasn't in the building or I was at that like command post. Okay. Right? Um, and can you describe what that individual is wearing that's not the police officer? Uh, it looks like a blue um, sweatshirt or hoodie of some sort, but... Okay, thank you. Thank you for your turn. Free, free, okay. Mr. Curley, to your knowledge, James or Jennifer Crumbly were not tenants of 1111 Bellevue, That's correct? correct. You have no idea if they had any knowledge of what the terms of the lease were, correct? Uh, yeah, that's correct. No further questions, Your Honor. But they wouldn't have had a file because they weren't a tenant, correct? Yeah. Objection, Your Honor. Speculation. It's probably you know they were not a tenant. That's correct. <laughs> We have a brief witness ready, Judge. Okay. They're watching this area. I'm going to keep them hungry. I'm sure they'll watch this area early. Good morning. Can you swear or affirm the testimony you want to give as a person? David Metzke, B A D I D, Metzke, N E T Z K E. Thank you. Good morning, sir. How are you? Doing well. Thank you. Tell us, please, how you're employed. Uh, currently employed with uh, Detroit Police Department. And how long have you been a police officer with Detroit? Uh, close to seven and a half years. Okay. Tell us, please, what's your current assignment? Uh, currently assigned to the Detroit Special Response Team. Tell the jury, please, what exactly is the Detroit Special Response Team? So it is uh, the SWAT team for the Detroit Police Department. Okay. Uh, tell us, what are some of the responsibilities associated with the team member of the Detroit Police Special Response Team? Okay. So our primary jobs are barricaded persons, uh, hostage situations, dignitary protection, high-risk search warrant, and future apprehension. Okay. How often would you say that you engage in these sort of duties? So I'm close to 60 barricaded hostage situations right now. And I would say a little over 200 warrants right now. Okay. Is this something that is a SWAT team member or special response team member you do on a, a daily or weekly basis? Every day. <clears throat> and how long have you been a member of the special response team? Going on four years. Four years. Okay. I'd like to direct your attention to about 11.30 p.m. on Friday, December 3rd, 2021. Do you recall that date and time? I do. And were you working or were you called in? I was called in. And tell us what that means, please. So I was probably sleeping at the time. Uh, my work phone goes off because we're always on call. Um, so it's last thing you wake up, you look at your phone, and depending on what you get called in, so that day we were called in for a future of apprehension. Um, we're told to report to the base. Uh, I reported my base. The right. Detroit Police Special Response Team base? Yes, sir. Okay, and then what do you do there? Uh, and I gather all my equipment up, so you know you grab your uh, rifle, your body armor, um, your belt, anything you need for your objective for the night. Okay, were you told at that point why you were being called in specifically? We knew we were going for uh, two fugitives. Okay, and so... Um, you got to the base and then you obtained your gear? Correct. And what happens next? Uh, then I was loaded onto the Bearcat, which is our smaller armored vehicle. Uh, and then we go from there to our assigned address. Okay. So if I understand you correctly, there are other members of the special response team with you at the base at that point? Yes, sir. And you said we loaded the Bearcat, so that means other members loaded onto the vehicle as well? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you recall how many? I would say around six. Six? Okay. And you traveled together to the um, location you were called for? Yes, sir. Would that be 1111 Bellevue in Detroit? Yes, sir. Okay. So, give us an idea sort of where this uh, location is. So, the closest geographic I would say would be like Belle Isle. Uh, okay. I'll go to like Belle Isle and then west off of Jefferson, but the closest I can describe it. Now, if you recall approximately what time you would have arrived there? It was late. I know we got recalled late, like almost 12. And 12 at midnight? 12 at midnight, correct. Okay. Um, so, I would say it took me about 20 minutes to get from my house to the base, and then after loading the equipment up, probably about 20, 25 minutes from our base to the location. All right. Tell us, please, what you observed when you arrived at that location. So we were one of the uh, last officers there because um, 
there's two different teams on special classes. There's a reactive team. The uh, first guys have take homes and they go directly to the scene. Take home, take home vehicle. Correct. Okay. And then the second set of team, which I'm on, they go to the base and get all the equipment, and then they go to the scene. So we were probably one of the last officers that arrived to the scene. Okay. So when you, when you arrive there, can you give us a number, approximately how many other law enforcement personnel you observed? So I can't give you a hard number, but I can tell you when we pulled up in the armor, it was it was packed. Like I've I've been to a lot of stuff, right? The street was like I didn't even know what I was honestly pulling up on when we did that. When we pulled up in that small bear head, I was like, well, "All right, I guess we're we're doing this." And uh, it was there was tons of officers. The street was it was bad. It was busy. Now, tons of officers. Are we talking about just Detroit or other departments as well? Um, I couldn't like once I got in the building, I could tell you more. But pulling up, I just seen I just seen a lot of cop cars. Okay. So it's, when you arrived, you made that observation. Did you meet with other team members? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And what happens next? So I got off the Bearcat. I grabbed the Halligan, which is like a, like a pry bar. So we're talking to you if you grab um, your Halligan and a ramp, because you never know what you're going into. Can you describe what those two things are, please? Yeah. So your Halligan, it's going to have like a sharp point on it and like rabbit tails on the end of it. It's like a bar, like I was just big. Are you talking about three feet long or so? I would say, yeah. Okay. So say, uh, then you have your ramp. We use a maritime ramp, so it's probably about like about this big. It's like 35 pounds, and it has a block on it about that big. Okay, just so we have a little bit of idea, making a record here. Uh, about a foot, a foot and a half longer. Uh, two feet, safe to say. Okay. Yeah. And you said there was an, an end on it. A square end, yeah. A square end, and, and that's what six inches diameter. Yeah, I would say safe to say. Yeah. Okay. And and what is that made out out of? You know? uh, it's enough to break the door down. So okay. It's steel. Okay. And you said about 35 pounds. Yeah. All right. So you grab those two tools, and then what happens? I grab the Hellion. So the Hellion. it'd be too much to carry your rifle, all your equipment, a ram and anyone. So I grabbed the Hellion. Uh, I came off the barricade, and I made entry to the door. It was like a smaller door. I remember coming in and then like going left. And when I got in, there was like a lot of officers there, my team members there, guys in jeans with like police vests on, like a marshal. There was, there was a lot going on when I walked in. Okay, I'm going to show you what's been admitted as people's 306. Is that photograph front of you, sir? Yes. Sir. Okay. And do you recognize what's in this photograph? Yes, sir. And tell me what this is, please. Uh, that's the scene where we uh, responded to you. Okay. And the, is that photograph fairly actually depict what that building was on the evening or the night of December the 3rd, 2021? Oh, yeah. It was, I mean, to me, you got to think I'm coming in at 1 a.m., you know, dark time. It was a warehouse. Okay. So I remember that. And here's 307. Is this the same building? different view? Yeah, that looks like the door I walked in. See how it's like a smaller door? To the left of the picture here? Yeah, to the left. Uh, right there, yeah. Okay. That's where I remember the call walking into a door similar to that. Okay. And that. And that's, tell us again what you encountered when you went in that door. So I came in. You testified that there were, I think you said, Tons of officers. It was more of like a be on the lookout or actually depict what that building was on the evening or the night of December the third, two thousand twenty one. Oh yeah, it was I mean to me, you gotta think I'm coming in at one eight you know, dark time with the warehouse. Okay. So I remember it. And here's three hundred and seven. Is this the same building? It's a different view? Yeah, that looks like the door I walked in. See how it's like a smaller door? To the left of the picture here? Yeah, to the left. Uh, right there, yeah. Okay. That's where I remember the call walking into a door similar to that. Okay. And that's, tell us again what you encountered when you went in that door. So I came in, and then I went left. And when I came in, I remember I had my team members here, which our team members, they're very, like, distinctive. Like, we all wear black, and uh, you have your SOT badge on, and you have your, you know, Kevlar helmet on. We're very distinct. And then you had other officers like patrol or you know unmarked officers. So I knew who I was going to run into with my team. Okay, so you have one standard uniform, that's our team. Guys. Correct. Okay, and you mentioned earlier um, individuals with jeans and vests that say police or correct. Okay. Yeah. So when you walked in at that point, could you give us an idea of how many law enforcement personnel you saw? There was there was a lot. Okay, a lot is in more than ten. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, more than twenty. Safe to say there was, I would say, yeah, 20, if not more. Okay. And this this building here, depicting people's exhibit 307, there's multiple floors. Correct. That's okay. Right. So. When you walked in, you, you mentioned you were on the go with your team. Tell us what happens next. So we moved, uh, I met up with my sergeant, and uh, you know they told us that what we're going to do, we're going to start moving to this building. We're going to be looking for these fugitives. So uh, SRT will clear you know, the first level, second level, third level, and move on up. So once we got in there, uh, I remember coming in. There was a hallway to the right. There was a hallway to the left, and then it kind of went like this, and there was like, two bathrooms on the side here. Okay. So did Detroit police have one specific assignment then? 
the trick, the trick release. Uh, uh, SRG. SRG. Yeah. Yes, at that time, correct. Okay. So tell us what happened going through this initial time. So we were looking for two fugitives. We started on the first level and we started uh, breaching, breaking down doors. Okay. Um, let me pause you right there. Breaching or breaking down doors. Tell us, please, what that entails. So you're using that RAM that I kind of explained, right? Um, it's usually one of the bigger guys on the team. They'll have, it's a really it's a specific form. So where you swing back and you're, you're using a RAM specifically to bypass the lock on a door. So you, you're pushing it in with the forks. Okay. Did you use this tool on, on one door or multiple doors on the first floor? Uh, I would I would call it using it on multiple. I would say not more than three, but I, I would say, say at least two to three. Okay. And that's on the first floor. What about on the second or third floor? So I remember before we even got there, we had K9 down there too, which was with us. K9 is in, is in police dogs? Correct. Okay. Um, from there, somebody said that, somebody notified our team that two fugitives may be possibly in the second floor and they never came down. So we went upstairs. When we got upstairs, there was another another SWAT team. It wasn't, I'm not sure what SWAT team was. It could have been a federal SWAT team. It wasn't Detroit, though. No, it was not. Okay. So we got up there. They told us that there was locked doors, but they could have opened doors at that time. So sooner or later, our team got a hold of a ring, like a full of keys. And I'm talking like, it was a ring, like 100 keys. And there you go. Well, these are the keys to this building. Use it, you know, so we stop breaking down our doors. So we started unlocking the door from the second story, and clearing it out. Okay. And, uh, that's on the second floor? Correct. Okay, so that's our, after doors were already breached on the first floor. Correct. Okay. Um, this is exhibit 39. Just to confirm, this is a the same building, 1111 Bellevue in Detroit, just from a different view. Oh, correct. Okay, correct. Okay, thank you. <laughs> now, after you obtained or your team obtained that ring of keys on the second floor, did you obtain information that the wanted fugitives could be somewhere in the building? Oh, uh, yes, sir. Okay. And do you recall where that was? So we were notified, I was notified that the fugitives may be downstairs in a particular room. So our team went back downstairs to the particular room and we lined up. And... Okay. Particular room, was it suite 130? I would say it's safe to say. Okay. So that would be on the first floor. Um, prior to that information being obtained by, by your team, that door was not breached, is that correct? Correct. Okay, were doors around that suite breached? Yes, sir. Okay, is that a loud process or a quiet one? It's, it's gonna be loud. Okay, and that's because you, you described the, the 35 pound ram and what it's used for? Yeah, break, you're breaking down, yeah. You're okay. slamming a door. Now on this particular evening, December 3rd, 2021, well, first of all, let me ask you, uh, do you recall the approximate time that you entered suite 130 at this location? Uh, I don't know the exact, it was late, I know it was late. I know we were clearing public for at least 40 minutes before we got there. Okay, and that's your particular team clearing for 40 minutes? Yes, sir. I'm okay. saying me, me, me specifically with my team. Okay, thank you. Um, were you equipped with body worn camera? Uh, yes, sir. Dennis, okay. And we had a date and time stamp from that body worn camera. Would that tell us specifically when it occurred? Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm going to show you what's been admitted as people's 304. This is body worn camera from that. Uh, just to confirm here, we have a date of December 4th, 2021, uh, 1.34 a.m. Your name is on the bottom of this? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, do you recognize this as being your body more camera footage? Yes, sir. Yeah. 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 
Responsibility would be in this situation would be to find and make secure the fugitives, but not to search the location. Correct. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Pause it for a second. Um, it's 1.42 a.m., 22 seconds. This, this is the hallway right outside of the suite where they were found in that, in that location? Yes, sir. Okay, just give an idea of the number of law enforcement personnel outside of that suite at that time? Yes, sir. Thank you. That's really good. Yes, Ron. Good afternoon. Yeah. Your role with Detroit Special Response Team, um, one of the things that you do is fugitive apprehension. Yes, ma'am. Fugitive apprehension is typically when there's a, a person who is not coming in to address allegations or charges against them, correct? That's it. Okay. Correct. Usually, fugitive apprehension is um, you get involved when it, and correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. It be becomes clear that that person is not going to come in on their own. I'm just going to object to the form of the question, Judge. He testified. He gets notified of when the report to base is given an assignment. You know, does the assignment. Yeah, are you the one who decides that? No. In fact, you receive information from your supervisors. Yes, ma'am. And you have no knowledge of the truth to the information that you receive. Truth or inaccuracy, either way. And I, I believe my supervisor's not to lie to me, so I'm listening to the order. So you get a phone call. And you go to the station? Yes, ma'am. You testified that there were, I think you said, tons of officers at 1111 Bellevue on December, well, it would have been December 4th of 2021. Yes, sir. Yep. Uh, December 4th. Yes, sir. You knew that there was a shooting at Oxford High School on November 30th of 2021? Yes, sir. You had seen media coverage about it? Yes, sir. You were aware of it? I believe so, yes. Were you also aware that James and Jennifer Crumbly had been charged in connection with the shooting on November 30th? Uh, can't say I remember or not. Okay. You don't specifically recall seeing that they were charged? Is that a no? Uh, no. Thank you, Your Honor. Exhibit 306 um, was a photo of the exterior of 1111 Bellevue. Your testimony was that you remembered it as a warehouse? Yes, ma'am. You learned that it was actually uh, a building that had multiple businesses in it, correct? Yes, ma'am. You knew who you were looking for in 1111 Bellevue that night? Yes, ma'am. You had been given photographs? Uh, I believe so. Descriptions? I believe so. You knew that they were the parents of the Oxford High School shooter? Yes, ma'am. And you received that information from your supervisors or from the other officers when you were at that scene? Yeah, I would say it's CPC or supervisors. Because okay. the reason I ask that is because you, you testified that when you pulled up onto Bellevue, you didn't know what you were there for. So I, I wanted to clarify that you, before you entered 1111 Bellevue, you were given information about why you were entering. I knew I was going for a shooter apprehension. And who it was? No, at the time they made entry, we found out pretty much who it was, I would say. Okay. Entry into the building? Yes, ma'am. Okay. You testified that you received information while you were inside of Bellevue that um, the individuals may be on the second floor and may not have come down. You remember that testimony? Yes, ma'am. That was not true, correct? Yes, yes. You learned that that was not true? Yes. The video from your body-worn camera, which starts at 1.34 a.m. in 20 seconds on the timestamp, right? It looks like 18 seconds on the timestamp. Um, it's quiet when your video starts, correct? Correct. You can hear yes, like a little bit of your movement with your equipment and stuff, but otherwise, you don't hear yelling. You don't hear um, any other sounds, correct? Yes, you would agree with that? Yes, sir. You recall when you entered the unit, um, obviously it was dark. That's it. Yeah, didn't leave it. You don't recall seeing police lights in the windows of the of the room, if you recall? Um, yeah, ma'am, I, don't pay, I wasn't paying attention there. You were looking at the people that were on the bed, right? Yes. In the middle of the room? Yes, ma'am. In fact, when you entered the, the unit, when you and your team entered the unit, James and Jennifer Crumbly were laying on a mattress in the middle of the room, which we saw. Yes. Uh, the James was laying on his side, if you recall. Uh, if you recall. I mean, if you were speaking in the video. They weren't covered with boxes or anything like that, correct? No. There was a, I think Jennifer Crumbly had a blanket on, otherwise James was completely uncovered. It's, it's, uh, he slowly rolled over as, as you all were giving him commands, correct? Uh, it looks like that. I think I paid more attention to uh, Jennifer. Okay. So. You don't recall him doing anything that would cause you all to be concerned. He didn't jump up. He didn't start to run. He didn't become combative. None of that happened from what you recall. Um, I would say he did none of that. But as far as our team goes, um, we're trying to take every caution as it, as it is. It, you know, we treat every person the same, we come up high, and then their reaction is how we go from it. And 
it's safe to say when SRT gets involved, it's typically, and you talked about high risk, dangerous. So you're going into these scenarios already at a heightened level of concern or security or awareness. Is that fair? Yes, sir. You don't you don't walk into the situation without all of your uniform on and your equipment and everything else thinking, oh, this is no big deal. No, we don't do that. Because when your unit gets involved, typically it gets involved in situations that are serious. Correct. And you guys are given information about situations that are serious. Correct. You guys meaning your unit. Okay. You can hear yelling if you recall. You hear yelling on the video. And, and if you know, you later learned that that was James Crumley. Okay. He wasn't yelling at officers. Okay. Do you, yeah. you recall that? Yeah, he didn't seem to be yelling at all. Okay. He was just making sounds. It sounded almost, and if you know, if, if you agree, it sounded almost like he was in pain. Uh, safe to say. And again, the mattress was in the middle of the room. James and Jennifer Crumley were on it. Yes, sir. They weren't hiding in a corner. No. Nope. They weren't hiding behind any of the, the raised countertops that were in there. Nope. They weren't hiding behind any of the um, the paintings that were in there. They weren't covering themselves with blankets. No. Nope. If you recall, your unit received information that James and Jennifer Crumley may have a weapon with them. Yeah, so then like in, uh, I can recall, we just treat as every person that we're going after as if they're possible is a weapon. Now you you all searched the that unit and you did not find any weapons. No ma'am. And you searched both James and Jennifer Crumley and there was nothing found on them either. Somebody did, I, I didn't get some weapons. Somebody searched them. Correct. Okay. And we talked about this a little bit at the beginning. It's not your job to verify whether or not the information that you received is accurate, correct? Correct. Your job is to get the call, right? Yes, sir. You go to the base. Correct. You get your equipment on. You load into whatever vehicle you're taking, and you go to the scene you've been called to. Yes, ma'am. Now, when the investigations are being done by your own department, you tend to have a little more information at the beginning. Is that fair? Me, myself. Your unit. So, norm yes, ma'am. I would say normally during uh, times that we get called out, it starts high and then it comes to us. That makes sense. High in the rankings. Yes. So it would go to your supervisor or their supervisor, and it gets filtered down to you. Yes, and if you recall, at around six minutes and 40 seconds on the video, I don't remember what the timestamp was, you can hear um, James Crumbly say we were leaving at 7 in the morning. Do you remember hearing that in the video? Uh, I'm going to check yeah. that, Judge. Has there been any testimony of that, nor has there been any indication that that happened? It, it's on the video, then. Well, then I think the video can speak for itself, but the jury can make the determination. And ladies and gentlemen, you um, can rely on what you see in the evidence and on the video, right? Do you recall hearing that on the video? Oh, man, we can run it back. Okay. Uh, yeah. I can put it there. It's at 624. This is 3 at 5, correct? Yes, Ron. I don't know if that audio is working. <laughs> Oh, I just, I don't know, can you hear it from this? Uh, yeah, so this is the second time you've watched the video, so yeah. Again, this witness can't interpret what he thinks somebody else may have heard. This camera obviously is three people away from where Jane Trump is in the video. The video would speak for itself. It does. She, she has to convert it. And he asked me to play the video back, Your Honor. And he said, if you want to play it back, go ahead. I mean, well, in did. response to a question of, did you hear that? Okay, so did you hear it? This. Thank you. I have no further questions. Sir, did you learn that they had active arrest warrants at the time you arrived on scene? Um, I can't. I don't recall. I remember for the fugitive arrest to occur, you need active arrest warrants. Yes, sir. Okay. And why would you be quiet right before you enter suite 130? Um, so that's a form of tactic. So we're trying to, we got, if you can see we use keys, correct? Yes. You can have two options. You can ram the door, throw a flashbang in, and cause diversionary, or you can come in and be quiet. It would be a shock effect that way. So our supervisor made decisions, use keys, lock it, and use it as a surprise factor. So everyone being quiet in the hallway, that was intentional, the tactic, before you entered this particular suite. Yes. Now, the, um, using the ram, that wasn't a quiet tactic, was it? No. Okay, so the noise level that would have been depicted before those doors were breached right around this suite here would have been much different. Yes. Thank you. have no knowledge of your own whether or not James currently heard anything that was going on outside that suite, correct? No. Thank you. No further questions. Alright, um, I think it's a 
James Crumbly, case number 22, 279, 989, FH. Thank you, Mark. Peace out, people. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Mario Lane on behalf of James Crumbly, who is standing by left. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Williams, would you mind? William Creer. Evidence, uh, generating report, and that's my court. I'm going to 
Okay. So as your job as a, um, a crime scene, um, uh, did you say investigator? Okay. Um, it's important to uh, distinguish. Are you a member actually of law enforcement? I work for law enforcement. Yes. All right. Are you considered um, a police officer? No, I'm not. All right. Is that then, would you consider yourself a civilian? Yes. All right. Um, how, how long have you worked um, as a, a, a crime scene investigator? 20 years. And all of those years of that, have you worked for the Detroit Police Department? Yes. I want to draw your attention to December 4th of 2021. Were you working that day? Yes, I was. And were you, are you, um, are you on shifts or are you on on call? How does that work? We're on shifts. Uh, my shift, I currently work on is from uh, 12 a.m. to 8, uh, to 12 a.m. to 8 a.m. And are you at home during this time or call when necessary or are you actually in an office? I'm in office. Okay. Um, on, De on December uh, 4th, uh, were you dispatched that day, if you know, to an address of 1111 Bellevue in Detroit? Yes, sir. Okay. Do, do you know about what time you received that dispatch? Uh, I believe around 2 o'clock. In the morning? Yes. Okay. Um, were you aware there was a search warrant that um, was being executed? Oh, uh, the request we got over it was there was a search warrant that executed at that location. All right. And what were your initial thoughts when you were dispatched to the location about what your your purpose there was? All we knew at that time was a search warrant application. Uh, we really didn't know anything else about it previously until we pulled up. All right. And when you pulled up, what was your observation? Objection on irrelevant. relevant. When you pulled up to the scene, what did you pull up? A lot of uh, news cameras around. So we were like, okay, this is interesting. In addition to the news cameras, though, what what was the scene like in terms of with law enforcement already on scene? Did you did you know who what happened at that scene? At that time, so we still was like we have a bunch of those details from the back of the search warrant. Um, we were never in that just some darkness of the moment. And so it was a course of the news channels on that night. And I didn't know how to do so. I didn't know that. And when we got on the news scene, I was talking about the search warrant. And that's when we got on the news scene. And when the state was actually going on, we were talking about the news channels. Thank you. 
You can tell that James Crumbly is a lot more emotional than Jennifer Crumbly has been through her whole testimony and her whole trial. But, you know, they really should have gotten Ethan some help. I'm going to fast forward through this break for you guys.
Okay, so court will resume tomorrow, and I will get you guys the trial for tomorrow. If I can't go live, I will give you guys another upload, and I do apologize. It's just I do work during the day. Um, I'm just not sure if I'm going to be called in again tomorrow, so I apologize again. Thank you, and love you all.